Hi, I started the stream, so I'll hang up and you can text me when I go around and test all the lights. Mic number one, check, check, one, two, one, two, three, siblings, siblings. Check, one, two, three, check, one, two, three, Bueller, Bueller, this is mic number two. That sounds a little lower. I'll have to make an adjustment on that. Super mic, mic number three, super mic. Check, check, one, two, mic number three. Prez, prez mic, prez mic. Check, one, two, check, one, two, test, test, one, two, three, one, two, three. Mic number five, five alive, check, check. Number Johnny, five, mic five, one, two, three, one, two. And mic number six, 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 mic number six. This will be for budget talk, mic number six. And lastly, I don't know if you can see me, but this is the podium mic, podium mic, now a wired mic, one, two, three, one, two, three. Hubba hubba hubba, who do you trust, who do you trust? Okay. Alright, I got your uh, texts. made a couple adjustments. This is the president mic. I um, dropped out the low end. I think it sounds better, not as muddy. And same thing with the super mic. I got to increase the volume on this on mic number three. So I will come back to this one one more time. See the super mic, mic three. I think this sounds better now. Mic number three, mic number three. And uh, I think that's it for mic check. I will clear the audio and keep the video up, and we should be good.
luck to everybody. Yes, thank you. Quiet. She's trying. She's trying to land. Or she didn't. She, she, she can be done at school. She can't wait to be done at school. Because to be a film major, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a master. You know, she's ready to jump in. It doesn't matter where she can land. We have a little Disney and Marvel, so maybe we can find something. Good evening. I'd like to call the names of the ladies and the names of the ladies. Cheryl Cardone, Assistant Superintendent of Pupil Personnel Services, and Dr. Ruby Harris, Assistant Superintendent of Business and Finance. Just a couple of announcements. The emergency exit is directly behind me and directly in front of me. Please silence your cell phones so that we will not be interrupted during the meeting. Thank you. If I could have a motion to approve the agenda for February 13, 2023, please. A motion. And a second. Awesome. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 7 0. Moving on to approval of the minutes for uh, January 9th and January 30th. If I could have a motion to approve minutes from the 9th and 30th, please. All motion. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 7 0. We have a couple student ambassadors with us. Uh, first from the middle school, Owen Hall. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Owen Hall and I am the president of uh, the VCMS Student Council. Um, this month is one of our busiest years, uh, busiest, sorry, busiest months and um, so first off, we have our uh, Valentine's Day soccer sales going on, uh, which students can buy a lollipop for another student, and on Valentine's Day it'll be delivered to that student uh, as kind of like a little like Valentine's Day since we don't have that in, uh, in middle school. Um, it's usually one of the most profitable events that we have in uh, VCMS. Um, we also are arranging a volleyball tournament for this Friday. There will be eight teams per grade, and uh, they will be competing against each other in their grade level. Every team member has to donate three dollars, and it will and it will be donated to the charity we are going to pick out next month. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. The show was a hit. There were three shows, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. The cast did an amazing job, and everyone had great things to say about the show. Right now, high school sports have also been doing great. This Wednesday, both girls and boys basketball have the NFL crossover games. And then the following week, they both start the first round of playoffs. Boys hockey had their senior night against a very good time and team Friday night and came out with a win, 5-2. Their first playoff game is Saturday, 8.30, this week at North Center. Girls Hockey started playoffs Thursday, and tonight they have the sectional finals game at 8 versus Niagara County at Cornerstone. Both boys and girls bowling have been doing great. The boys are 5-7 and seven in the NFL, and the girls are 2-10. and 10. Unified Bowling has had two matches so far, one versus NW and one here on the island against the Fierce Niagara Falls team. 
The team is doing great and having so much fun. They have the best cheering section around, so if you're interested in catching a match, the next match is February 17th at Mullins. Their season ends with an event on March 7th at Airport Lanes with 35 other participating schools. Boys Swimming has also been having a great season in starter sectionals this past Thursday. Wrestling has been doing a great job as well, and they did an outstanding job in sectionals with multiple wrestlers placing. Winter Ball was this past Saturday, and it was a lot of fun. Everyone seemed like they had a great time, and the music was very good. On Tuesday and Thursday, there will be the String Kaleidoscope Concerts, which is an all-age group play at the same concert. Wednesday, there will be an all-island concert. Midwinter break is coming up. We have off the 21st and 24th, and we have off the 20th for present. Okay, that brings us to correspondence, recognition, good news, and Disney High School Musical with Mrs. Pute. We had to bring our whole crew with us, so um, just if you were part of the musical, please stand up. We have our tech crew here and some of our um, amazing actors, as well as our choral director. Um, just like our, our cheesy musical says, we're all in this together and it has been an amazing experience and um, these kids really should get a lot of the acknowledgement of the hard work that they've put into everything and being a part of our show. So I just want to make sure I spotlighted them first because they're really the most important part about this show. So. Um, some other really big things that I think really happened, we hosted Kegabine and Hugh Road 4th and 5th graders. Um, and showcased how important being a part of the arts are um, in our in our in our community, um, and they really had a great time. Those kids laughed and clapped and just had a great time, kind of watching a lot of their students. Um, many of our teachers remarked about how amazing it was to see some of their young ones grow up um, into these wonderful performers. And we talked about um, both our our orchestra program, our band program, and our choral department, um, and we highlighted those. And they got to see our amazing set. Um, made by Mr. Sweet and his tech crew. Uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we sold, we had over 1,800 people here over three nights, which is um, amazing. We had a basket raffle that um, we had uh, a hockey stick uh, signed, uh, Tage Thompson stick raffled away, so we had a lot of different opportunities. We had uh, souvenir cups that we put together, um, so we really did a lot of things that we felt went into this production aside from just the singing and the dancing, and we really encompassed, I think, a lot of our programs here at the high school that work together. Can we, would it be possible yeah. for each student that was involved to say their name, what they sure. played, if they're seniors, if they have any plans? Yeah. I was lucky to hear yeah. yeah. Or if they're in the tech too, yeah. like what you did in the I, my name is Gavin Rice. I am a senior here at Grand Island High School, and I was in the ensemble. And my future plans are going to Niagara University to get a degree in secondary math education. Oh, great. Any math teacher. I will say the awesome thing about Gavin is last year he was in our pit. He played, he's an orchestra player. And for him to make that transition this year was really awesome to see him come alive on stage. So that was really great. Uh, hi, I'm Cosmo. <laughs> uh, I played Jack Scott in the musical, and um, uh, my future plans are I want to go to Binghamton and uh, for a computer science degree. I'm Chase Harden. I helped design and build the musical set with Mr. Sweet and the other kids. And I'm going to study technical education at Oswego. Nice. It's also summer, if you didn't notice. <laughs> um, I'm Caitlin Fay. I played Kelsey, and I was also part of the tech crew that built the set. Um, next year, I'm not sure what school I'm going to, but I'm either going to study tech education Tech Ed or Chemistry. So. Hi, I'm Kathleen. I'm a senior and I played Gabriella and I hope to go to University of Pittsburgh for psychology and music. Uh, hi, I'm Alejandro Perez. I'm a sophomore and 
Um, I plan on going into performing arts when I'm, when I'm older. Not sure where. <laughs> got some time. Too much. Yeah, I got some time to think. I got some time to think. I also like um, engineering, like civil engineering. That interests me. Uh, um, can you just tell the group here that uh, the, the name of the character you play and the similarities between that person's life and your life? Oh, I didn't say it. Who did I play? Oh. Um, Troy Bolton. Troy Bolton, he is balancing um, the, the musical audition and his, his big basketball game and, and, how, <laughs> and how that affects, affects his relationships with his his friends and his family, and then the girl that he likes, and it it really touched me because that's the life I lived throughout the whole process of this show. I was a wrestler this this season, so a lot of the times I was going in between practices. There was one day where where I went three three to four at, at the musical rehearsal, and then I went four to five at wrestling. Came back from wrestling and jumped on the stage. Like literally ran, ran, ran down the aisle and jumped on the stage and went straight into the scene, and it's it's definitely hard with with the perceptions that other people have of you. They're like, oh, you're a wrestler, you don't sing, you don't you don't you don't do that, or or other people being like, oh, we we need you on stage, you can't can't go wrestle, but it 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 definitely like touched me and I it was like method acting, it was like method acting. I like I didn't have to put myself into his headspace. I was already in the headspace. So, yeah. Very well done. Hi, I'm Charlotte Tower, and I'm a freshman, and I play Miss Garbus. <laughs> I'm Jenna Morton. I played Sharpay Evans, and I'm a junior, and I'm looking into music education major for Fredonia. Um, what a talented group of kids. So we're really proud of them. Jenna, your dad made me put that photo on. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Slinging hot dogs at the beginning of the year. But um, if you even like take a look at the back of our t-shirts, we have a list of all the cast and the crew. And it's just great to see how many departments in our building actually touch upon this one production. Um, and I think for a lot of our students, that's what's so unique about it, is they, call, they all come from different backgrounds, um, but yet we're all together on stage singing. So it's going to be really hard to top that next year. <laughs> Amy, could you have Mr. Smith just step yeah. up and just share with the board the amount of work, time, energy <laughs> yeah. that went into that from set? It was a pretty uh, remarkable uh, set. We started in what, September, September, I believe? Yeah. We started on a whiteboard, and Tay and I literally were just kind of drawing out what we wanted, or what she wanted. Go through with it. Um, then we, uh, my crew, I have three, I have my eight team, I call them, fourth period, they come down every day. So I have Chase, I have Faye, and I have Brayden. They're down literally every day during our study halls, helping me, not just with the musicals, but other random projects we're doing around the school. And we started with a sketch on graph paper, and then we drew it in the computer, and then we had plans, figured out what we needed to buy, and then basically all of December we were building. Many home people run. Yes, <laughs> and I thank the building, well, building some grounds guys because they picked up some, like, 50 sheet goods and over 200 2 by 4 one, which has made, saved me a lot of work from throwing them back in my van. Um, but all December we were building, the week after Christmas break, after the um, musical, the musical events were done for the holidays. Uh, we started construction on stage, and then it was too tall. Yeah. <laughs> what, is your, what is your class called too? Just in case there's any students. Uh, well, this is like that. This was just oh, wasn't this in the was class. Just, it's just okay. like these three come down on their own time. Oh. Okay. And then after school, we offer like I have a lot of students that need government hours, so Mr. Simpson said they can get government hours if they if they help. Right. So we had a lot of extra helpers, but these three were. Can they stand up? Another round of applause. How many students? This might be a question for Mrs. Butte, but how many students would you say were involved overall in the musical between the stage crew, the sets? Yeah. You can hear us applauding next door. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had. Uh, 
probably about 80 students from the stage, from stage crew, um, which, is, which isn't here tonight, but we actually have a group of kids who are behind the scenes doing lighting, doing audio, doing all the set moving, so we had them. Um, not only did we have tech students helping, we had students in our government program who helped, we had our business students putting stuff together, but um, our core group of stage crew, tech crew, and our cast, um, about 80, and then we had one member of the pit as well, Sebastian Hadley, who was amazing. And before we let you go, Mr. Sweet, I know this isn't about the musical that I'm going to ask you next, and you didn't know I was going to ask you, but today you had some special guests uh, present yes. to your students so, in the robotics engineering. So today in the robotics and drones and so the electronics class, um, in October, I went to a touch truck event, and a four-year-old was obsessed with anything trucks, mm -hmm. and I met with the Erie County Sheriff's the bomb squad guys the robots. So I finally got in touch with the right person, and they um, came out to school today. They brought two of their drone platforms and two of their robots out. They did a whole demo on what they do. Students had good questions for them, like how did they get to where they are. And they didn't only talk about becoming an officer, they talked about other jobs that are in the field. So like, we can actually build these bots, and they talked about the facility in Alabama, and how it's not, you don't have to just be the guy driving the bot. Um, they also allow the students to actually control the bots and have a little time actually using them because they're a little bit different from the little back spots that we drive at school. So it was a really cool experience. And it was funny because my students that I had last year happened to be in the other room. Like, Why didn't you get that? <laughs> Some of them stuck around because they had lunch and lunch. But it was, it was a really, it was a fun experience, I thought. We're very proud of you. And I remember when you and Mr. Laurie and your team came to us with this new course, and it was really exciting. I stopped in today to see uh, the fruits of your labor, and it was outstanding. It's come a long way. Nice job. <laughs> so, uh, the course, again, is robotics That's, and engineering. It's robotics and drawing. And and Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. looking for action on items 
A through B, um, obsolete buses from Auctions International. That is just the acceptance of the sale of that list of busing, um, list of buses, as well as it shows you the amount that we received in revenue from selling them. So that is the highest that I have taken notice of um, in the sale of buses. The same is happening in the area of vehicles. But you will see as we do the budget presentation that the cost of buses and the cost of vehicles are also going up. Um, item B is goods and services trade with the town of Grand Island for the Oxley trailer. I believe it was two board meetings ago where we declared that obsolete. We have worked with the town as we continue to try to do shared services and initiatives to see if they had some type of um, need or utilization for this. Um, they did, and they were willing to give two years of salt. Uh, the details do outline that piece by piece, and it really just, the, the cost of the salt really just depends on the type of winner. Um, we have, so we did think it was a great deal, and it's a way that we get to keep items that we purchase right on the Grand Island to service the entire community. Um, item C. Dr. Harris, oh, just a quick question. Um, Sue, Sue would ask me this over here. If we needed to have it back for a special event, kind of a special summer festival or something, do you think that the town would allow us to use it? I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. Um, I can get that uh, in writing, but. Um, they seem very willing to uh, work with us. The next item is item C. Uh, that is the Grand Island Central School District Office of State Comptroller audit. So this is an audit that usually occurs, usually occurs every five years. Um, we did get selected maybe a year or two ago for a special audit, which was a small group of school districts. But it really focused in the area of um, IT and the business office systems that are used. So it is your practices behind the scenes with passwords, um, user groups, who can use what, um, turning services off, cross-checking with one another, all of the process and policies for that. The corrective action plan is the uh, item that needs for approval that then goes back to the Office of State Comptroller as well as the state. And the Corrective Action Plan also has dates. Um, most of those dates are by the end of the 22-23 school year. There is one item that has a December of 23 finish date. Um, I am hoping to get that done quicker, but it does involve figuring out somebody else to handle something system-wide that doesn't have access, so it gives us time to teach that person as well. I just would add, uh, Dr. Harris, that sometimes we aren't always uh, in favor of audits, but this audit did uh, shine a spotlight on things that we do need to improve to right. keep, um, you know, cybersecurity and data uh, as safe as possible. So, yes. so we did respond quickly. Yes, and I just remind people anytime an auditor comes in, they're going to find something. It's their, it's their job to do such. Um, but uh, this was, in my world, it wasn't a heavy lift. I know in IT's world, they bothered them more than they bothered me. Uh, so I'm sure uh, Robin and Mark and everybody enjoyed them. Um, but we implement the things they ask for as we can, and we also had a very honest dialogue of what just is not, we're not able to do as quickly. But um, it does require some changes for everyone. Um, some of them I don't even like, but you know, um, we will move forward with the recommendations as well as some other things uh, that you'll hear about in the presentation. If I can have a motion to approve A through D, please. Yeah. And a second? Also. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any extensions? Motion carried 7 0. And then you have E and F, which is just for information purposes, budget transfers under 15000 and the check warrant information for December. And then we have our presentation. Yeah. So good evening, everybody, and this is our first budget presentation for the Board of Education as well as uh, our faculty, staff, and the community. 
So we thank you for your interest in our budget. Every year I talk a lot about our mission. Our mission is to inspire all students to achieve their greatest potential by fostering academic excellence, personal growth, and social responsibility. And tied into that mission is uh, goals that we have that help guide us as we create a budget. Uh, the first goal is to, to develop a long-term sustainable budget designed to provide the best diversified educational program for all students, including universal pre-kindergarten through grade 12, and in some cases, students with special needs who are with us until the age of 21. The second budget goal is to retain all community-mandated student programs and activities and to protect the fund balance. Also, as uh, an overarching set of goals that helps drive our mission each and every day are the five-year strategic plan goals that help guide us. Uh, and those are to steward the district toward improved services and support that fosters the wellness and behavioral health of students, to continue to work with uh, other districts and stakeholders to improve our connectedness to uh, our town, as well as uh, Western New York, and to make inter-building communications and practices as seamless as possible. All of these goals are uh, challenging goals, and we are working on them every day uh, today, we met for several hours just on the third goal here, doing a better job with interbuilding practices and communication. And also, as five-year strategic plan goals, uh, we are always working to foster a level of academic achievement that is emblematic of championship school districts. At our next uh, budget meeting, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Cardone and Mr. Loria to talk a lot about this, and Mr. Loria, I know you'll be able to share some exciting good news as it relates to academic achievements. So we'll have that ready for you in the next uh, budget presentation. Uh, also, this was a big goal for Mr. Loria and his team to ensure the completion of all curriculum as well, continuously fostering the expansion of STEAM or STEM curriculum, and then finally to review, revise, and expand benchmark assessments as appropriate. This just outlines the process. Uh, Dr. Harris works uh, diligently starting in November with all of our principals and supervisors on the development of the budget. That continues on into January and February and will continue all the way through April. So I appreciate your leadership in that area. And uh, you'll see uh, this outlines the budget meeting dates in the future. I'm gonna ask uh, Ruby just to talk a little bit about the uniqueness of this schedule because we have two board meetings in March which will count as our second and third budget presentation. We're a little worried because uh, the governor uh, won't really have to present her budget until April 1st, but Ruby, if you want to just highlight that a little bit. So um, in the past, and it's really, I think it's just the way Easter break fell this year. Sure. Yeah. Um, Last year, we had a very early April meeting in which we presented the budget. Um, usually, we have something from the governor's office by April 1st, which will solidify solidify your state aid numbers, which really the concern is foundation aid. Um, some things have changed. They're doing the phase-in, so that's great. So we're getting the funds that are our funds to get for Grand Island. But the other component of that is there used to be um, a little sentence that pretty much said, in the event when the April budget comes out, you will get at least what you had in the first run for foundation aid or more. That is no longer that language. So last year, if you remember, um, we did our presentation, I believe it was mid, middle of March, maybe, and then when I came back in April, foundation aid had been reduced almost $100,000. So um, right now we're not saying we need to scrap the meeting or we need to schedule another meeting, but there is a concern that we'll do the March 27th meeting and then you won't see me again, not me, but you won't see the uh, budget again until April 18th and that would be the date you had to go. So if there was a reduction of funds, 
then you would be getting the information that same day you're voting on it. And if there's an increase in funds, you would be getting the information the same day you're voting on it. So um, we're really going to play it by ear. Maybe we'll be lucky and we'll have information earlier than the March 27th date. So as we learn more, we'll share more, but that is a concern, just the way it's going. Is there no way to that was what the Easter was the 16th. I mean, is there not a date you can put on the schedule if you need? Um, I mean, if there's a big fluctuation, that's going to be a big ask for us on April 18th. Easter is the 9th, so that's why we're not having the meeting the 10th, because that's uh, Easter Monday. So that's actual, actually a holiday. What about the 10th? Are we off that one? So we might be able to schedule something Tuesday the 11th yes. if we needed a, a special board meeting that night. I think tentatively, um, we're to mark that date on the calendar on um, April. 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 April 11th. I, I just, I, you know, it's a Tuesday night and we've all seen crazy things happen at the end of our budget process and I would need to get in here and have to make big decisions. Right. I agree. With limited time. I mean, especially, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, if we don't need it, we don't need it. But it might be nice to just have a tentative date. So tentative, and then um, as yeah. soon as I know that yeah. I, I would also uh, add that once the governor's budget is in, Ruby will do her analysis and we'll push it out to the board oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to show if there is a need to meet on the level. Right. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Because for if there's so no changes, then what you see on the twenty seventh. Can you remind me again? The forecasted number is this from you or the where are you looking at from for the foundation aid? Are you looking at the guess? yellow print slide with all the? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Just save your question and then I'll know exactly where you're asking it. So let's okay. put it on there if we need it. We need it. If not. Okay. Sorry. Then in addition, obviously, the 18th is when the board adopts the budget. The 8th of May is the public hearing. And my birthday, May 16th, we have the budget vote and the board election vote. So it should be a really great day to spend here for Long day. more than 12 hours. Um, well, I get to do a budget presentation on my birthday. Oh, there it is. We got it covered. It's all good. We're all good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Definitely reason to have cake. Ruby, anything you want to highlight on this agenda today? Um, looks, looks like we'll be covering the normal things. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so the next one is for Dr. Harris. Okay, so um, as usual, I do try to highlight just some key areas of the um, governor's executive budget message. If you'd like the entire message, we can uh, share that with you. But I, I pick out the major things that impact the school district. Um, so the first thing you'll see here is foundation aid. Uh, there is a 2.73 billion increase. Um, the minimum Not for us, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh. For the state. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I wish. Just want to clarify. <laughs> um, the minimum increase was the higher of the 3% um, increase. Uh, over the 22-23 aid or the school district's uh, full phase in amount. So we are in the category of the full phase in amount. So you will see that we received far more than 3%. Um, we'll go into that a little bit more in the next slide. The next item here is expense-driven aids. Um, they have not attempted this year to uh, remove this or change the way they are allocating. These, there is a little caveat um, that I noticed in reference to uh, a free state of reviewing this information. I don't know if that will be forthcoming, but it really just means that the information you're reporting to the state by probably like a December date needs to be correct so they can freeze what their projections are. Um, the part that is not so nice about that is if you forgot something and you're attempting to make that correction after that date, it might be blocked out. So um, that will be something that I will be advocating not to happen, uh, but it, it's not the biggest uh, concern. The next area is universal pre-kindergarten aid. You will see on the next page that we did receive an increase in UPK funds. 
Um, we'll talk about that a little bit further when, I, when we get there. Um, that's great. It just means more students will have the opportunity to participate in the program, but I do want to explain how that works. Um, the next area is um, an area that I'm sure we're all excited to hear about, uh, which is the zero emission school buses, but it, this is a progress report. It's really um, the state wanting to know where are districts with the plan, um, if they plan to purchase buses within the next year or two, how many they're planning for, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we will talk about zero emission buses, but there are many steps, and the first step is just getting someone to come in, review your current uh, area where your fleet is, as well as the grid. So we're starting at the basics, and then we will build upon it as we get more information. Um, but that is something that probably we will see happen, is them asking us to do some type of reporting of the plan. Is that 2030 or 2035? I believe it is 2035, by 2035. I think there was a two-year extension yes. attached to that as well. And, um, yeah, there, you know, um, I know I've attended a couple of presentations. I know Dr. Graham has attended probably more than I have in reference to this, and there's still just a lot of questions. Um, we did have the opportunity to go to Lakeshore um, to physically ride on one of the buses and ask the questions, but they are just purchasing their second bus at full price. Their first one they actually had my grand funds. And so it'll be yep. telling when they put it up for a vote, and they're asking for one. Um, so, and a full size bus will cost over 400000 Yes. And 180 Yeah. Is that right, Teresa? Yeah. So. so, I do just, you know, we will talk about this because there is a slide about transportation, so this will get it out in front. Um, I believe, and I think I'm in alignment with Teresa and Ruby, that there are far too many questions that are unanswered as it relates to beginning a process of purchasing a $420,000 to $430,000 bus um, and not really having the data to suggest the, the length of time that that bus will uh, be sustainable over the course of 10 years or more or less. Uh, there are some savings, uh, of course, but there are way too many questions at this time. So I like that we're going to be moving slowly. Brian, yeah. Brian, when you say there are savings, is there any math that anyone's been through that just Lake Shore, yeah, savings, savings yeah, Lake Shore had suggested I think ten to fifteen thousand dollars in maintenance savings, oil changes, and things of that nature. For a bus that costs two hundred thousand dollars more, right? Yeah. So in ten years, maybe you end up being equal. Right. There's so much. It's just so late. I mean, I'm just. Yes. I don't know any. We're, we're you know, digging deep, trying to understand it. It's, it's, it, I would be, it would be foolhardy on my part to recommend to this board and to the community to purchase a four hundred and twenty or four hundred thirty thousand dollars bus without enough information to back that up. It would not be a good May sixteenth. <laughs> There'd be no cake. Okay. Okay. So there's so much more to learn. It's not that we're against you know, zero emissions. Yeah. And there may be buses that use hydrogen fuel in the future, too, that we're not even thinking about. So way, way too many questions. Uh, and I honestly think that it would be wise for our legislative group to uh, extend this you know, uh, goal of 2035 to you know, maybe another 20 years, because it's just, uh, it's just not uh, feasible, I think, to or appropriate for us to be asking for that kind of stuff uh, without an update. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's more than the cost of the buses. We have to probably change. I mean, we have to add charging stations and probably Absolutely. change the structure of where our buses are currently stored. I mean, and just for those that don't know, it's just not the education world that has to go through right. electric. It is all your metro buses and everything. So they really have to look at the supply and demand and how fast <coughs> the production of these buses can occur, right? I mean, we have what? 
believe it's over 60. I was going to say 70. Is that my books? I will just say 70. I mean, that, I mean, times border 20 times production and all the schools and across New York State. And the other buses. side is state aid, right? Yep. So uh, buses are an able expense. So if the goal is all school districts, whether you contract out or purchase your own or buy these, then the state is saying they have the funds on their end to aid it back. <laughs> and I'm not saying they do not have the funds, but I just think there are a lot of changes that are going to occur within the next couple of years. With, um, American Rescue funds being depleted, uh, the federal funds being reduced, all those things that I'm mean, just concerned how we can keep this up without affecting just simple foundation authority. So. Okay, and then there are some um, interesting employee relations and civil service um, proposals that I, I thought were important to mention. So one of them is the proposal that would increase the minimum wage automatically each year to keep pace with inflation after it reaches the $15 per hour. So I know for a long time that's been the discussion of getting to 15, but we, as we plan, not necessarily for this year, but future years, that is something to keep in mind. Um, I do know we have some positions right now that are at the minimum wage limit, so the moment minimum wage increases, so do those for subs or for staff. So as we are planning, negotiating, this has a huge impact on the ground, so I thought it was important to mention that. Um, and there are also some uh, recommendations for the Department of Civil Service which hopefully would be helpful to all school districts um, in the hiring process or having to uh, take a test, the process of waiting for scores to come back, and, and the test just being integrated. So as I know more, I'll share more, but those were the big ticket items. All right, the numbers. So the first item you will see here is foundation aid and you will see $1.9 million. Um, last year it was a little bit over a million. So they have phased, not only phased in, but they've also done a percentage increase um, on top of that as well. Something that is new is foundation aid high impact tutoring set aside. Um, every year something is new. <laughs> um, I do explain that a little at the bottom. So this is a portion of funds that was actually included <coughs> in the total foundation aid number. I pulled it out because it has to be used specifically for the items that are listed below. Um, another thing that Dr. Graham found is he read some information to me that <coughs> it has to supplement. It cannot supplant, which means it has to be a build on or an add to um, your school and your program. It cannot be used to say, hey, I have a teacher that I believe um, is uh, in the RTI and math and providing those services, and I put the funds towards that person. It has to be something new. It's an increase to the program. And in all honesty, next year this may look a little different. I don't know what that means for the state. <laughs> they just say it's for the 23, 24 school year. So I don't know if that means those funds go away or they just get wrapped into foundation aid after they see that you've done this. Okay. Superintendents find it a little concerning that the state is taking the funds and saying you have to do it for this or you don't get to use those funds. So uh, for our district, um, we will be working with our principals and talking about adding in a teaching assistant uh, for survey uh, youth and pipeline in the middle school. So it would be four teaching assistants that would equal just about the cost of this um, this set aside funds. And those teaching assistants would work with teachers to provide that additional high impact to the schools. You don't know if you're going to be the Correct. Correct. Or or or, if it, or we'll start to see more uh, fund our foundation aid sliced up even greater by our legislators and and body who create these budgets and saying we need to spend it on this and then you need to spend this on that. So we're a little concerned and we are pushing back um, as a group of superintendents across the state. So 
but just to clarify, it's part of our fully funded foundation aid, but that's been asked in addition to it. So on here, you will see that they gave us um, 1.9 million. The 1.9 million is not inclusive of this 208,000. So 1.9 is what I can just use as uh, revenue to the district in the different ways it's needed. The 208,000 is a separate little bucket of uh, money, and I will also let you know that that separate little bucket has a separate expense line, so it becomes very easy to account for it, because I do think this is something that they're going to come back and want to see proof that I could see them asking for HR information, showing it's a new hire, or showing that you've never used this vendor in that way before. And it's very specific. It, it actually uh, prescribes the amount of construction and that high impact tutoring. So uh, you, you know, I don't think you could buy a program. You, you have to hire people. So, and and the, 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 the best way to get the biggest bang for the buck and impact our, our schools in grades three through eight is to have the teaching assistants. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we we already have programs for our children. Yeah. 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 Right. So that's what I thought. So it's so specific. Yes. And I'm sure um, at the upcoming business official meeting, they have I'll be asking people what their plans are, um, because this was based on a formula that the state had uh, to let us know how much of the funds. So it's not everybody is using 208,000. Um, it is based on you receiving a percentage more than 10% than it's a <laughs> um, so you have districts that, some districts do not even fall into this category of having to do this because they may only have received 3% and that was it. So, yes. Any other questions on that one? Okay. Um, UPK is the next area and <coughs> you receive $405,000 additional, um, which is lovely. It comes with a lot of additional work. But just so you can um, understand what that means in a per pupil um, world, that is 75 <coughs> additional children can participate in UPK. Um, so yep, a lot of the eyes are getting bigger. Um, so we will follow the process that we have been, and our RFP will go out. I believe it is it's already out um, to see what. Uh, White or providers. Yes, community providers on, uh, on the island are interested, how many rooms they can do. Um, I know I've heard from more than just Dr. Graham, like, well, oh, we can open another classroom. There's a lot of things that need to be discussed. I think the most important thing to remember is the allocation is based on the number of students that actually participate. So if I don't get one additional kid over what I had this year, I do not get to tap into that four hundred and five thousand dollars extra. They don't just give it to you. It, it is based on the number of children that are so the teachers do. I'm assuming is it involved in the lottery? If we have the same state. I just remember for years we've always had a lottery because we just didn't have we had more students than we had right. funds. Yeah. If our enrollment goes up, it would probably still be a lottery. But this past year we pretty much went through the entire list. Oh, nice. except for this is a significant increase that we're skeptical of we can even use. Yes. And so um, in the in this past year when we were still waiting to find out the number of um, students that were going to pos possibly participate, um, I asked and will continue to ask, I asked each um, community provider, what is your minimum number of students, right? What is the minimum number of students you have to receive to run your program? Because that helps me understand how we can um, how we can do our best to make sure that all the children that want to participate actually can participate. Um, and they gave that information and it worked out really well. Um, the thought process is the initial funding part will work out 
seamlessly if those numbers are relatively the same. Um, and then if we have overage, that's where we're really going to be looking to see classroom space, um, how many classrooms providers said that they could actually house. And there might be changes. I know um, different organizations, after they finish their first year, they may say, hey, I really liked it. I'm going to open another one if you have a slot. So we'll work through um, those items. but. We will attempt, if we were to do something within the district, that it's net neutral, right? It's, I don't, I don't want to come back and say in May, hey, you approved all this stuff, you want to do a class, but we can't cover it within the grant. So we will work through all of those groups. So it's one community provider, even though we have like increased enrollment. We, we have multiple. Yeah. No, I mean. There's a bunch that will go for their PPG will choose. We literally, yes. So we, I know for this year, it's always been yes. one. So we went from the one, <laughs> the one that was always the one. Yeah. two years ago, I think we had three. And then <laughs> this year, they're like, just going to get that work. <laughs> I think it's five, five this year. year. Yeah. So as we keep growing, these, we keep adding. Yes. Growth. And there's, there's still, um, there's still reviews that happen. Um, I know myself, uh, Mike Antonelli, um, Mr. Loria, we have linked each year that we run the program. Um, they go, we do site visits. Yeah, we do site visits. Um, we review different information that's given because, you know, uh, we don't want to just put kids any place. Um, we want to make sure that they're being prepped and are prepared for when they come over to Sidway. And I think uh, Mr. Antonelli over there would agree that um, he can he can see that as the case. Right. So I have a question about the the funding. If right now is it a half day like twelve students in the morning, twelve students in the morning, all day, all day, every kid, every kid would be all day, every kid is all day, right? Is now. all day and it will be under this. Yes. The because it, it used to be half day. Yes. A few yeah. years ago, and now it's been. So all of the new funds, so everything outside of, I think it was around $110,000 uh, about three three years ago? Yes. So all of the funding received after that requires it to be full day PK. In the event that we had a provider um, reach out to say, hey, I want to do half day, are you willing to do that? We could figure that out with that very small first allocation, but everything else is um, is a full day requirement for um, the state. And in reference to um, any of the lottery component change, I'll be very honest, they throw the money first, and then they give the guidance that they're going to change it. They won't even start having meetings until April of August. So included in with this, and I'm trying to there, because now it's a full day, is there a meal plan for the district? So, um, is it included in the department of this? So, the students that go to Sidway mm -hmm. definitely receive lunch. Um, the students that go to our community, they also do. Um, some of the components of that are different based on the facility and what they may qualify in aid or grants, but that is incorporated. How many, how many kids are currently in the program between us and about? I want to say 105 to 100 kids. Yeah. And, that, and how many are with us? 36. 36 and the rest are community-based. And then they want to add 75 kids? Yes. If you had 75 more, I'm not sure there's 75 more. Right. There. No, right. there aren't at least one, if not two. Yeah. Right, so that's, that's why we do the question yeah, there's, of... There's, there's, what is your minimum? How many classrooms can you do? Um, what does this look like? So I know it, this past year, the additional slots have really allowed um, people that have been interested as community organizations to um, tap in and give it a try. I think it's been going really well. So we may even see them say, hey, you know, I did a half the class, maybe they only asked for nine. That could increase um, as well. So we'll just keep you informed as we become more informed. Yeah, we'll know more next week because their deadlines are coming. Yeah. They're good Yes. And then when is the lottery? Oh, 
so that's not usually surprising. Um, and then the estimated based on the 1.2, based on the $1.2 million increase is $17.52. So estimated to actual um, is a $0.56 cents increase, which then again is 3.3%. Dr. Harrison, the actual number isn't really known until August? Correct. Yes. Sorry. You, I feel like you either ask that every time. Or Glenn asked that. Why are we asking the more? Yeah, so the yeah. information Glenn, is um, based on the prior okay. year's uh, property assessment, and then that's all updated, and the Board of Education actually receives that and votes on its approval in August. Yeah, so can you explain the change from this presentation and probably when you receive the information in August will be the tax rate. It will not, the, the amount we're set to levy, we will levy. That is the, the requirement there. But if you have more property, um, new builds, anything can change that number, that has to be taken into consideration so you can levy the correct amount. Because if they did not do that, we may levy too much based on a tax rate that's too high and the assessed value or you may not levy enough in the event that um, something were to close or um, another thing that can happen is someone could put in a dispute and say they don't believe that their property is really worth that amount of money to see that um, happen. And usually you don't see it as much just year by year. You usually see it when there is a reassessment and that happened in 2020. I think a lot of those have already shaken out. Um, and then the town provides us with the updated information. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, I well, didn't know. Well, the other way of looking at it, the levy from last year was 38 million 318. Mm -hmm. And the levy, the maximum we can do this year yes. is 39. Is 39, 5, 9, 4, and change, right? So, so the levy limit has gone up. And how that's allocated between taxpayers is how you get to the rate. I get right? it. So, so okay. yeah, that's, that's the one part that's not here. Oh, okay. I just showed her the math. Who knew? I just said, just showed her the math. But yeah, we're good cool. now. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I don't This slide um, is something we added last year, and it shows what we budgeted for the current school year that we're in, as well as where we stand with the proposed. So it's really just carrying that information. And then it's projecting out a couple of years. Um, I'm not only working in the area of finance, but just across the board with everything, trying to get a lot more projections so we can plan better for the future instead of just 
a, a one-year review as we're doing budget planning for that upcoming year. It just helps us know, hey, maybe we should move in this direction for what we have coming up in the future. Um, one thing I do want to note is last year's proposed um, increase was 5.59 when we actually received all of our information from the town in reference to the assessed value. Um, it was actually 4.69%. Not too much time, but um, less than definitely what we thought it was going to be. Any questions on this slide? And it's a nice tool that can compare one year to the next in reference to uh, different things that come in. So if you actually look at last year's presentation, you'll be able to take this and compare it to them to see if we're kind of spot on. I'm sure some of you are already tempted to. Um, this just takes a lot of what we talked about in the area of the property tax levy as well as the state aid and shows it on one um, chart for the summary of all revenues. That is the new slide I gave you with the little yellow part at the bottom because it was missing. We'll update the one on the website. So, not much, um, not much changed. Uh, you will see building aid has went down. Um, that pertains to some of the BOCES expenses going down in reference to capital, um, as well as there are there are assumptions that the state will not make in reference to um, the security cameras. So we receive. The budget for 35000 for security cameras, you know, are aided on a higher percent for that, but the state will not just assume that you're going to continue that year over year. So that is something that once you guys say you can move forward with different things, that I will make sure is increased. Um, sales tax is re relatively the same. Um, we see BOCES aid. We always go a little bit lower because it really depends on what services we do use and what areas are aidable. Um, and the other thing to take into consideration is with the American Rescue Funds, there are some things that we're using federal funds for that BOCES cannot be assigned because that is considered double dipping. Um, and then you have our different uh, eight categories. And as we started last year, I carried forward the appropriated fund balance in the lump sum um, amount instead of just identifying which reserves, which was something that our financial aid So this just shows where we are with state aid, what it is as a percentage change from one year to the next, and the basic budget is just the total uh, budget. <laughs> Can you go back? <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, just because I think I missed it. Um, when it says other receipts, what, what are those? You didn't miss it. And you'll be happy to know. Because you know, I know last year I had that one that was other. Oh, I printed it this meeting. <laughs> I knew it was coming. And highlighted them in yellow. <laughs> So um, other receipts can include textbook charges, student fees, admissions, um, turf and field usage when um, we receive revenue for those rentals, um, other rental of real property, uh, rental of buses, commissions, gifts and donations. So there's just a lot of different things that go in there. You mentioned security cameras. So um, security camera aid falls under building aid. So when the state is doing their projections for building aid from one year to the next, that is a number that they will take out in reference to aid. Because they, do, they don't want to make any assumptions for you. Um, so there are times that when you're in the midst of a capital project, it will not always be reflected in the state's number because you have a financial final cost report. So there's things that we know on our end that the state does not know. And so they remove those things. They um, also remove capital outlay. They do not assume that 
you're going to approve a catalog every single year. So that's why I mentioned that. So is, uh, like what you're saying is they don't assume that we're going to approve additional security cameras? They don't assume security cameras, capital outlay. The only thing the state will assume is something that pretty much has an amortization schedule. So that will be building aid for capital uh, projects, and they will also assume that for transportation aid, because you're, you're putting how much you borrowed um, for buses and the length of the borrowing. Beyond that, everything else is uh, us sitting down as a school district and business officials marking off like this is where our number is and this is what we'll receive so I think if you look back uh, maybe two years ago maybe last year but I'll pull it I think it was two years ago the state had a, one number for building aid and I had a higher number because I knew we had final cost reports that were being submitted and would be captured but it would be captured when they uh, re review the information once they have the report so just so I'm understanding security cameras I Yes. So um, we know that, but the state doesn't know that. You could you could decide next year. So hey, are we, are some obsolete? Are some not working? Because I feel like every year, for years, we always have a since I've been on the board since like 14, I mean, we've always approved security cameras. So I mean, there's only so many places you can put them. So I'm assuming that we, we have they're about, being replaced. We have about 245 cameras. So do we still we do? We, we do. Every yeah. Year? Okay. Yeah, so we're when you walk down the hallway, maybe when we're walking out today, I'll show you what a new one looks like, what an old one looks like. Okay. So in this building in particular, we have vigilant cameras that are brand new. Yeah. They're absolutely outstanding. We've had a few issues in some buildings where people have tried to break into the building or cause damage. No, as long as they're oh yeah. Fine. I just oh, I feel like we just constantly. Yes, have but what's happening is we're replacing the milestone cameras with the vigilant, and it just takes about. Yeah. And they're, they're, yeah. the cameras are expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the state also has <coughs> their own in place of this is how much we will fund per camera. So you're finagling those components too to just try to maximize the spend on them. Right. So I think I think Kegel might just got an upgrade with the digital cameras, right? Mm -hmm. And simply say again? The front doors. Just the front doors? The front door systems are available now. Okay. So it's going to take some time. I think Sidway also needed more. We have a very, very limited number of cameras. So not only are we replacing, but we're adding. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Sure. Should I switch? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And just for our students to know, probably in another five minutes, we're going to be letting the students go. Okay. Unless you want to stay. But, uh, You're welcome to stay. Some of you can't drive fast enough. One more slide. Well, I got it. Get you through a little bit, all right? One more slide. Why don't we have our students who would like to leave come up to the board table? We'll sign a sheet. And you're welcome to stay as well. On your choice.
Thank you, Paris. It was okay if we jump back in with it? Sure. All right. Thank you to the board for that little break. Thank you, everybody else, for hanging out with us. Yes. So the next, um, the majority of the rest of the slides are pretty familiar to the to the board. Um, the, the slide you're seeing right now is the summary of major expenditures. We have our salary area, which is just contractual obligations um, that are included here. Um, also included here is some of the information that Dr. Graham mentioned in reference to the um, addition or the set aside for tutoring. So we have taken that into consideration there. Um, in the salaries as well as in the benefit area, um, so that's reflected. Substitutes has increased, um, there's really two reasons. One, um, minimum wage increases that are occurring as well as the struggle that we have had with um, getting subs in all areas. Yes. All areas. Do you want to talk at all? No, I think, I think it's just important for the board and the community to know that it is a change mm -hmm. and that based on uh, the dollars that are put in this budget, we will be recommending increases in uh, substitute categories all across the district. And that would include administration, as well as uh, teachers, and uh, clerical, and everybody. So. Um, this we still have, what, is it seven building-based subs? Do we still have? We have building-based subs, but we can't even fill them. Yeah, we can't even We have positions. open. We still have open uh, vacancies and for building base subs, so just been seeing a lot of heads coming. So it's very no, challenging. No, I know. I was, I was just asking. Yeah. Yes, we still, um, we still have them budgeted for, and we attempt to hire. Um, it's just getting people is, and, and it's. I think we just like pick them off of one another. Okay. So when someone sees like, hey, your rate is higher than their rate. And yeah, yeah. And those building-based subs, do they come in every day? Or? Usually four days a week. And then... And I know, just let me ask the question because I know this never happens. But they come in whether we know or not. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. 
I realize we have a shortage and could probably never have it. I just wanted to clarify. There may be a few days a year where Building Day Sub isn't covering a teacher, such as the opening day of school or something like that. But otherwise, uh, they're pretty busy. Oh, well, and I realize that. And what do we do with them in the event that they are not? I know it doesn't happen very often, but let's just say. So we share between the three elementary schools. So every morning the three of us talk, and if somebody's shorter than the other school, we send them to the other building. So within the three buildings, even though they're assigned one building, we do share them between all three. Awesome. I, I know it doesn't oh, happen That's a very good question. And probably, Mike, if none of you need it, then that person pushes into a class. We push it into support one of our classes class. that needs support. Yes. yes. But I don't know if this happened since the first day. <laughs> and I realized that I just, <laughs> just and I did clarify before I asked. I was just wondering. In general, I'm just, sure you have that. Just, just so uh, people know at the secondary level, I don't believe we filled those positions completely right. with what? Yeah, there are vacancies right now. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So That's why those questions were hypothetical. Is it four days due to health insurance? Yeah. So they don't receive health insurance. That's correct. Which could be a reason why we can't fill it. So maybe, I don't know if there's ever been a consideration for it's I a think very layered the building at days, once you hit five days and health insurance, I think they're just Let's stay in 40, 40 days. Just want to clarify, since COVID, we haven't been able to fill the positions. Prior to COVID, they were filled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. They work five days and help them, so they almost become contract. Yes. Well, if, they, if they get the 40 days, so the, five, the four days on one day out prevents them from having to continue those shifts. Yeah. Yeah. So increasing the per diem rate is, will be helpful. That'll be something that comes after the budgets. <laughs> after the budgets are perfect. But um, we'll have recommendations. Absolutely. Um, and that might be um, also something that you'll see in the future uh, annually across the board, especially with um, the wage things, just making sure that we're being proactive instead of reactive. And the nice thing is we do hire from within quite a bit. So that's a great starting point for uh, interested candidates. Yes. Um, the next area on here is the cash slash credit um, payments. That has been working out since we've done that increase. I think it was, it's been at least three or four years now. Um, that has been working um, out well, and uh, we continue to work with the union if, if issues arise with that. Um, so there's no, no increase there. Um, benefits, this is inclusive of our self-funded plan. Um, New York 44 is pretty much completed, uh, and then we also have stock loss uh, increases. And stock loss is the additional insurance on your insurance um, in reference to high-cost claimants. Um, you'll get more information from me uh, in the near future about that and rates and other things that are forthcoming with that. Um, you also then see ERS and TRS. Um, these percentages were last year's percentages, so I will change that so you have the new numbers for ERS and TRS. You'll also see them on the next slide. And then FICA, and those are all just um, representing the fact that your salaries are going up, so uh, the retirement and the FICA components increase as well. Um, retirement benefits has a slight increase here, and this is primarily just we've had more um, civil service, SRP uh, employees retiring, and this allows us to capture it. Uh, the reality is whether we capture it here or not, when they leave, we have contractual obligations uh, for their um, payments, um, their allowable payments, so this just allows us to not have to take them other areas that and then this number will again change for the upcoming meeting because we will have retirement letters in um, and that will be reflected of uh, anybody that is requesting to retire if they request to retire. It's March 1st now. We took them April 1st. It's March 1st now. Um, the other uh, area on here is workers' comp insurance. That's just a slight increase. Um, you will see OCs increases. Um, there are a couple of uh, component pieces to that. One is op, um, occupational education has increased. Um, we are billed a year behind. So that is based on the 
current year's number of students that are participating in the program. So we've actually seen this number kind of up and down and up and down as we get um, larger levels of classes that go over smaller classes. And I know Dr. Graham uh, works diligently each year just to make sure the students that are participating in the program really have a need to participate. Um, and the kids that can stay here and take all the wonderful things that we offer, stay here and do that um, as well. Um, debt service is just our debt that we have to pay, um, simply put. So that includes um, the capital project uh, borrowing components that we're paying off as well as, um, as, well as our buses. Sorry about that. Um, you will see it's listed as gasoline. I did receive a text message today from Teresa to change that to fuel. So I will change that to fuel for the next meeting. Um, but there is increase in cost. Um, I know we've already done some transfers in, even in our current school year to try to make sure that we can cover the cost for this year. So we're just planning for that in both the transportation department as well as buildings and grounds. Um, Special education has an increase here, and in that is so. So we will have um, school for the deaf. School for the deaf. Yes. Um, so we have a student that is attending, uh, I believe, at the St. Mary's School for the Deaf. And basically, what happens is you pay the tuition cost, and the state pays you the following year. So, yeah. So I am estimating the tuition cost here because we have it now, and then the state will follow up in the following year. Any questions on that one? Yeah. Um, Dr. Graham, you said we always have some type of special education tuition, but this one does funnel, um, function a little bit different than the normal um, special ed education student going to a place that they receive. We actually get more back the following year than we do with the, with the expense. But that's not for every student that is for This is for the same year as well. The school for the school for the So that is a little bit different. Um, we also have we also have on here. I'm going to go back because I did skip a line. Um, utilities. Utilities has increased tremendously. Um, I did a, even a review of last year, the last two years versus what we paid last year. And there were, um, it, it was over 20% of an increase. Um, we worked through um, like a shared service uh, type program with BOCES. They have given projections thus far and they are saying between 15 and 20 percent. So as I know a little bit more, if that number needs to change, um, we will adjust for that, but I just, you know, I don't want any surprises and like utilities have to be paid. Um, you will see some building maintenance increase increases, and you're going to see a, a lot of increases as we go through the next section as well. The cost of everything is uh, contractual, um, transportation supplies, I did sit down not only with the um, administrators, but people that are putting the orders in, just trying to understand what's going on to have a better uh, way to express this to the board that um, these aren't just things, they're not just wants, um, they're real needs to keep functioning the way we have been functioning in different neighborhoods. Are there any questions on the major expenditures? Okay. Um, the next <coughs> slide just takes um, where we've been with TRS and ERS in reference to percentages and the change in cost year over year. So um, you will actually see, as I expressed, the number on the last page was 10.29, that's the old one. Um, so they are estimating for TRS to be 9.76%, so that's a slight decrease. Our hope is that that continues to decrease year over year. 
um, but we'll see how that goes. So that is where the $2.9 million is total cost comes in, as well as the $57,000 increase. And then ERS, um, it, So um, ERS also is a slight increase, and the things are over here, which says it's not. Mm -hmm. I've talked to you all. You can't sing anymore. I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> it was on a timer. Right? Nice job. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> TRS gives you a percentage. ERS actually gives you a range depending on what tier you actually fall into. So the change in cost is an estimate to them? Yes. You're using a range? Yes. Right. A range based on information that they I'm had from a time ago. Yes. I have a question on the previous slide. The special education tuition that this year was the $1.2 million. Do you know how many students that um, provides tuition for? Think about how many are we placing? So we talk about that. Updating every single month. That's why we're in the binder. Okay. Yeah. 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 It accounts, at least from the, sorry, at least from the list that I'm looking at, I would say it's accounting from, for at least 18 to 20 children. The other thing um, that we do when it comes to special education tuition is you build in slots because the moment that you have a child that moves into your district and they are placed at an out of district placement, you're supposed to keep that child at that placement. You're not just supposed to move them or bring them in the district because you feel um, that it could work. Um, there is a whole process that goes on. Um, I think it's like CSE meetings, discussions, to even see if that is um, possible. But um, when the child first comes, that child would go there. The same happens for students that are special education and go to both seats. Those tends to be a lot more costly <coughs> per child that you don't have to keep up with. Seventy thousand dollars a year. It's like you're sending them to an Ivy League school. You know, that doesn't it's a lot, right? It's wow. You're really looking about fifteen, fifty thousand dollars, depending on what place that you're looking at. And then I have to get additionals. I always, I always slot additionals, and and it doesn't always happen, but. It does allow, um, I mean, we had some move-ins um, this year. It allows for those children to come in for us to be able to cover the expense without 
coming back and saying we need to take from other programs or what are we doing to cover the cost um, of those students? Well, season's coming up. Everybody. I mean, everybody is shocked at the cost of her. So, it would be the next couple slides are just taking all these numbers and breaking them down. Yes. Almost as line items. Yes, so I'm not going to go piece by piece. This summarizes um, pretty much 95% of what you saw on the last slide. What this also provides is a little bit of a description. Um, one, if you look at I see the number right All right, all right. <laughs> I was gonna say I know I wrote it somewhere. Between um, nine point six yeah. and nineteen point nine percent. Yes. So um, this just breaks down each area. A lot of them are number for number. What you saw in the front, the area that will look different is when you get into um, each department or building. Um, one thing I do want to make sure um, I just reference here, and if you have questions. You know, you can always email me or ask me or wait to the next meeting and, and ask it there um, for everyone to hear. Um, but in the building area, so you'll see each school building listed out. Um, it's a little bit below where you're at, Dr. Graham, on the slide. Um, but it shows textbook. Um, at one point, at one point in time, we had taken the textbook funds, if you remember, and we put them all in one account. Um, it was back when we had some um, transitions out, some transitions in, and we just did not know what the game plan was for the curriculum. Um, we feel a lot more solid. Now, with that game plan, and we worked with the um, building administrators, and we are putting those funds back into each one of the buildings. So you see text, textbook, 10000 It's not Sidway asking for $15,400 more than their building has ever had. 10,000 of that is just me shuffling textbooks out of a business office code and putting it into the building. Um, and then we also, as you've also seen last year, we need to start adding back conference and travel. We have put it in grant funds on um, the last couple of years, but as those grants dwindle down, um, conference and travel are used for professional development opportunities, I think that's really, it, I would say, professional development and workshops. So putting the funds back in the buildings allow for that to continue moving forward. And then a lot of other stuff is just contractual. High school is under um, similar components, except for they have a bigger pot, in general, of funds. And graduation has increased. Um, I think it's, it's significant, but just the cost of being able to rent the place, the um, materials and supplies that we purchase for graduation. So we're just making sure all of that is captured. Um, as I said earlier, transportation um, has a, uh, a large increase, and a lot of that is just contractual and supplies. Um, so that could be the uh, student system that we use for um, actually putting in the students and making sure they have been routed to simple products that at one point may have been 60 or $70 or our um, auto mechanics that are now triple or quadruple the cost to, to get it if they're even um, producing the product. So those things have been taken into consideration there. Um, and then debt service is really just uh, flip-flop. So uh, less in interest, more payment in principal um, on both uh, components, on the bus and on the uh, capital side. So that's taken into consideration. Um, you will see here that it said we'll, we'll be recommending $22,000 increase to align with food service plan. I was just waiting to see if Sue was going to say anything. <laughs> well, because it comes up later. Yes, it does. I'm waiting until later. <laughs> okay. I can bring it up. <laughs> no, it's all right. We'll wait until it's on the slide okay. all by itself. Um, and then you will see the <laughs> revenue side as well. So um, that shows the foundation aid increase as well as the building aid and most aid decreases. Um, you also see the tax levy limit. 
So you will see the total appropriation versus the total revenue. And right now we have a budget gap of $692,000. So just to illustrate that, if we rolled over the budget and didn't add anything to the budget, at this time we're still $692,000 shy. Mm -hmm. okay. Dr. Graham is going to write a donation. <laughs> we talked about it. <laughs> Any questions um, on these slides? I mean, I can write a check. I don't know about <laughs> cash, but... And then it's going to yeah, So we're just going to talk a little bit about enrollment. As uh, the board is familiar with these slides, this slide indicates that in April of 2020, we had 2,815 students attending our schools. And uh, we, uh, in the 2020-2021 school year, uh, the enrollment uh, declined to 2,742. Uh, many, many, uh, much of the decline uh, were families choosing to homeschool or uh, choose private schools uh, due to COVID and restrictions in public schools. The 2021-2022 enrollment went back up to 2,816. And we're going to take a look at how enrollment has changed at the high school. In the 2016-17 school year, there were 981 students. You can see a slight decline each year. And also, you'll see our projections and the variance of those. So for this year, we are projecting 884 students, and we have 858 at the high school right now. And next year, we're projecting 910, and um, yeah, we're flat, right? So, yeah. but I, I, no, I you, changed you made a change, yeah. chart, so yeah. it would look pretty Oh, easy. these were projections I had for years to come. Yes. And now our year. new projections are here, yes. right? So we're, uh, yes. So uh, last year, I was predicting in the 23-24 year, we would have 910, but we now think it would be so you can see, though, that there has been a steady decline at the high school level over time. At the middle school, it's kind of bounced around. Uh, when I got here, we had 700 students in the 2016 to 17 school year, then very close to 700, and then in the 650s for several years. You can see that we are um, projecting 631 students next year, and last year I projected lower at 615, but now we see that it could very well be at 631 going into the next school year. We do see a big change uh, from one year to the next. At one point, I was predicting 566, but now it'll be closer to 600. Uh, and that's just the variance of people moving in and out of the district. The combination of youth and kegabine over time, you can see 840, 845, 851, and then a significant dip in the 2020, 2021 year, and now uh, rising back up. So I believe I had predicted 806, and we are at 817 right now. And that's youth and kegabine combined. Sidway, this is probably the best news. Uh, you can see that there were very low numbers of kindergarten and first graders in the 2016-17 year and so on. You can see a steady increase at Sidway, and uh, I believe I predicted 448, and we are about 430. And that's students in uh, general education classes as well as self-contained combined in kindergarten and grade one. So this is probably uh, good news for the district that we're seeing numbers, you know, uh, classes uh, around 200 or greater than 200 at kindergarten and first grade. This just shows you over time each school and the changes and the variances uh, and the total, uh, as you'll see, at one point 2,894, 2,816, and uh, around 2,778 at this point. Current elementary class size ratios, uh, the board has seen these slides before. These three columns represent Sidway, these three columns represent youth, these three columns represent Kegelbein. What you're seeing on this slide are not students in self-contained classes, 
only students that are in general education classes. So this year we have 193 kindergartners and 225 first graders. There are 10 teachers at kindergarten, 11 teachers at first grade, and the class sizes are 19 and 20, respectively. And then the totals are below. And then you'll see youth. This is second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade for youth. This is Pegabine, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. You'll see here that the average class size at youth is 21, and the average class size at Pegabine is 21.7 or 22. There are 17 general education teachers at Pegabine, and 20 at youth, and 21 at Sibley. So this is just uh, that last column just broken up for you, uh, looking at all three schools, the total number of students, the total number of classroom teachers, and the total class size, or the average class size. This chart is a chart that I use to help predict our kindergarten enrollment. Uh, we get this from a company called Forecast 5 Analytics, and what they look at is the uh, births that are attributed to the island here uh, five years ago. So where this arrow is showing, they are indicating that there were 169 births five years ago that are attributed to Grand Island. They're uh, multiplying it by a percentage, and they're predicting about 187 to 190 students uh, for next year. Okay, so that you can see that's a change from the predicted number the previous year. Okay? And if you look ahead, 169 birds, 172 birds, 178 birds. So these numbers are low. So the, the factor that remains that these are birds, but it's not a, uh, it's not looking at move-ins, people moving on to the island or moving out. So this is what we are projecting early as of now. The, the, these projections are as of February 7th. So we're looking at 210 kindergartners. That's a projection. It's a little high. This chart says it'll be 190 to 200. So we'll keep an eye on that throughout uh, kindergarten registration to see how accurate, but we're going to estimate a little bit higher this year. Uh, keep, uh, and then flip-flopping uh, teachers. So we had 11 teachers in first grade and 10 in kindergarten. We're just going to flip-flop at 11 in kindergarten and 10 in first grade. And you'll see that the average class size would be at 19. Does anybody on the board have any questions about what that looks like for survey? And then for youth, uh, those first graders that you saw, uh, 120 of them are going to youth and 107 from first grade are going to Kegelite. So these would be the new second graders. Uh, you'll see that we're estimating the same number of teachers at youth and an increase of one teacher at Kegelite. That increase goes from 17 to 18. The average class size at Kegelite would be 21.6 and at youth 21.4 and then at Kegelite at 19. Anybody have any questions? These are just projections. Secondary enrollment, you'll see that currently we have 199 sixth graders, 213 seventh graders, and that bubble of 245 eighth graders. Uh, our sixth grade population is served by nine teachers, which gives us an average class size of 22. Again, these numbers are not representative of children who are in our self-contained classes. You'll see the numbers of kids in self-contained classes below. So projections for next year, you'll see that again, uh, you'll be looking at 199 or 200 students going into sixth grade from fifth grade, the same number of sixth graders go on to seventh grade, and then a smaller number of eighth graders. So that bubble goes over here to ninth grade. And you'll see that this brings us down uh, to 611 from the 657 number. Does anybody have any questions about this? So really that brings us to um, some of the requests that we had for the board last year. We want to thank the board working with um, us as well as our principals and supervisors for some of the new additions that we added to the budget last year. We had an English as a second language teacher added, a social worker added, a speech teacher, uh, it says was removed from most services 
and just $39,000 savings. We did add an elementary teacher, uh, 0.4 addition, we had a 0.6 elementary position, we added 0.4 to make that over one FTE, and that was the increase uh, in the budget last year. We did add uh, to our athletic director stipend, as well as the National Academy Foundation, uh, an additional budget request that we were able to satisfy, and a transfer of food service at 8,000. And this was all the additions to last year's budget. Ruby, is there anything else we need to highlight here? Well, the, the request there a lot longer. <laughs> the request. Yes. And I think, you know, this is, I don't know if it's unique to Grand Island, but um, the way that Grand Island operates in the budget process is we, we show the board everything that's been asked for. It may not make it to the finish line, but we're, you know, we're very transparent in what has been asked for. So you'll see that the high school is asking to increase. Right now there is 2.8 social workers at the high school, and this is a good an increase from 2.8 to 2 FTE. Uh, an increase at, from art, and of course this is always uh, directly related to the number of course requests from students, but right now we have a 2.4 art teacher salary, and this would ask us to increase that from 0.4 to 0.8. Uh, there's a request for an additional special education teacher, a library aid, increase in English uh, instead of having a 0.5 uh, English teacher and a 0.5 teaching assistant this would ask me just to make an, an English teacher request so that has a, a request of only an additional 16,000 uh, related to that request a diversity equity and inclusion council advisor which would be somebody from the GITA taking on that role and the request is 1300 and a GSA advisor, another request of 1300 GSA? Is Also, for middle school, a request for an AIS math teacher, AIS ELA teacher, uh, a school counselor request, a request for future consideration of team of students, uh, a request to increase the web where everybody belongs coordinator stipends, uh, which would result in $5,444 increase. National Junior Honor Society Club, which would be new to middle school, and the cost is shown here. The French Club uh, increase, $1,300. Environmental Club, $1,300. And Book Club, $1,300. Some of those are new and some of those are existing. The web coordinator already has a stipend, but this is a request for an additional amount because of the amount of work and the embeddedness of the work that goes on throughout the entire I just meant in general. And oh, it, sorry. It, it would be very helpful to know what is an addition and what is... My understanding is these are new requests, um, and they're, usually what would happen is there is a club that is not working, we would work with um, GITA who has the different clubs listed and um, we're able to usually swap something out. If, if all your clubs are running, um, then any new request would require some type of um, MOA. We put them here because they're requested. This is also a nice way as we enter into future negotiations to say, hey, these are the areas that our um, administrative team is um, supporting we um, would believe if it's up here that they have staff and faculty that would like to run them and it would go forward in that style. But they do put them here so they're heavier all new clubs. Correct? Is Except for one. Except one. Yes. Yes. Right. The one. additional is new. Yes. That's an additional stipend. Like an addition to the current stipend. Yeah. What do we currently have for math and ELA? AIS as far as we have in the middle school, we have one AIS ELA teacher, and we have one AIS math teacher in this school to cover all three grades. Very good. And Sidway has a request to add a teacher for math intervention as a teaching assistant position in the class is shown here. Pegmine uh, requested an elementary teacher, if deemed necessary, based on enrollment, the special education teacher, 
a talent show stipend, which would be a new max, I think, right? Yeah. Talent show stipend would be a new max. For her. Oh, yes. Yes. Looking at Max, yeah. we should disappear. <laughs> Sorry about that. So that's new, that is not a stipend that you have now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. And Heath is requesting an AIS teacher, a full-time teacher, not a teaching assistant, a STEAM teacher, and an elementary teacher at the necessary based on enrollment. For the district, uh, there's a request to add another English as a second language teacher. Sure, I'll be just highlight that a little bit. We did add one last year. Yeah, we did. Um, so I did meet with um, the ENL department um, and the PC and also um, Felicia as well. Um, it it would be really uh, beneficial to our increasing enrollment to have an ENL teacher in every building. Um, right now we have we do have an ENL teacher at Sidway. Um, we do split our um, high school um, with Kegamine and also high school middle school position, and then also we do. Um, have another student that travels between the elementary buildings as well. So if we, you know, the ask is for one ENL teacher at each building to support the students, make sure that they're getting um, the minutes, um, because sometimes traveling in between the buildings helps cut some services down. So that it's uh, why we're asking for one more ENL teacher due to that increase in enrollment over the course of the, since I've been here. So. In the, for a second budget presentation, you'll be able to show the numbers of how this program has grown over time. Uh, school resource officer, currently we have one FTE covered by two part-time Grand Island police officers. The request is for the board to consider two FTEs, which would be four part-time uh, police officers uh, operating as school resource officers. Uh, this is a new request to for the district to hire uh, an athletic trainer and not use a sub and, and to start moving away from subcontracted work uh, that we get out of the Niagara Falls Memorial Medical Center. So this is a request to hire our own athletic trainer. We're seeing that athletic training in general across Western New York is increasing uh, well beyond what our contract is now. That contract will eventually go away and we will have to pay uh, about very close to the same amount of money as uh, we're asking for the board to allow us just to hire an athletic trainer uh, moving forward. So we'll have more information about that in future presentations. Also, we would like the board to consider a new position in our technology department as a chief data protection, security, and compliance officer. This is directly related to the Office of uh, the State Comptroller's audit and all of the necessary uh, elements that we need to uh, be compliant with as it relates to data security, cyber security throughout our entire campus. Uh, the audit did show areas of weakness that we need to improve on. Additionally, uh, we see this new position uh, helping us greatly with overall physical plant security uh, with respect to the cameras that we use and other layers of security that we have associated with our cameras. We see this as a, a, a growing need to keep us, our students and staff safe, uh, not only from cyber attacks, but uh, other uh, intrusions that could occur on our campuses. So at the next uh, budget presentation, we'll have a presentation from Robin Fitek and Josh <coughs> a little bit more on what this might look like in the future. Uh, we see that we had a request from the community education coordinator to add a 0.5 FTE position, but that has already been moved to a future consideration. Uh, we're seeing a trend across uh, Western New York of school districts adding flag football as an option for our female athletes in the spring. Uh, this is becoming uh, highly popular. I've been asked by several um, students and parents for uh, the district to uh, support the idea of flag football as another sport for our uh, female students. And when you compare and contrast uh, 
sports uh, for boys and for girls across the district. This would, if we did add this, this would actually bring us, I think, almost perfectly equal between girl and boy uh, opportunities for, for our students. Uh, I think even in the Super Bowl last night, there was an ad for, for, for female uh, flag football. And Jim Kelly was in that ad. So, uh, so more to come, more information to come about flag football. And then uh, through our business department, there's a request to add a 0.5 uh, support staff clerical position uh, to support the needs <coughs> of our business office. Does anybody have any questions right now? The ENL teacher, what building, what building would that be for? So we have an ENL teacher, which building now, which one would that be based on? So, so right now we have many of our ENL teachers are going all over the district. Um, we have one that's split between Kendrick and Cube, another one that's split between high school and middle school, another one that's split between middle school and high school. So that position would just allow us so that we can have one at Sidway, one at Hughes, one at Kegelbine, one at Middle School, one at High School, so they're not traveling and splitting um, the caseloads up amongst mm -hmm. them. Okay. And the, um, the projected secondary enrollment is that, I see for 22-23, we have nine classroom teachers at grade six, and we're projecting eight. Is that a recommendation for a cut in a teacher there at grade six? Yeah, it's not a recommendation at this time. It's just showing the board what class sizes would look like if if we did move a teacher to a different building to cover a need at a different building. So remember, at sixth grade, we have <coughs> elementary certified teachers in our middle school, and they are eligible to work in our elementary schools as well. So we could maintain nine teachers next year with class size of 22 in sixth grade, or we could consider going to eight teachers in class size of 25. So it's just a, just showing the board what might happen if we did move a teacher from middle school to elementary school. Okay, so we have, right now we have four ENL teachers, and we, we, the request is to make, increase that by one to five. ENL teachers, one based in each building. Sure, go ahead. Um, for Kegabine, for Kegabine, it lists special education teacher, but it doesn't specify if deemed necessary based on enrollment. Was there a retirement, and that's why we need an additional teacher for Kegabine? We, we don't have any retirements yet. So that'll come to us by March 1st. So, so this, just this, in there, just in case. this is just a request from the building to add special education support. Uh, it's just the beginning. We just share all the requests. And then over time, we <coughs> analyze it through Cheryl's department to see if there is a significant need. But are we sure? I mean, is there, are we sure we special education support? So, so right now, so um, at Q, well, we have a special education teacher at every grade level. Plus, we have um, a self contained room. At Kegabine, our total of self contained room, grade two through five, has grown tremendously. So, we have two, instead of one this year, um, two 12 on one teachers. They have split that into grades two and three, and four and five, which then makes a split of a co teacher in between third and fifth grade. So one teacher is in second, one teacher is in fourth, and then we split this year to have a teacher go in between third and fifth grade to accommodate the um, large increase of our 12 and one classroom. In our 12 and one classroom, um, I did have a meeting with the um, principals last week. Our 12 and one classroom in the district two through 12 have grown exponentially. Um, so, correct. I should that I say that correctly? I had one more question about the EML teacher. How many students do we have receiving EML services in the district? So what we're Are seeing, students? Yeah, so what we're seeing is not only um, an increase in numbers of Ashley, but also the needs. So for instance, we just had a high school student um, that entered. I'm just going to give you an example. He does need EML services. 
Um, so that is a one student need. However, because of how he scored on the nice slot test, he is in need of two periods of ENL services to meet state requirements. So not only are we looking at that increase in number of ENL students K to 12, we're also looking at the needs of our students coming into the district that not only need maybe one period of ENL, but they need either a pull out and a push in, or they need a certain amount of minutes um, to make sure that they get to that next level in order to exit the ENL program. We hover around, um, over the last few years, we hover around 40, 50 kids. Um, usually needing one period or two, thank you. Um, <laughs> so um, in 2021, we had 50, 55, um, and I did present this last year in 21-22, we were up to 60, 90 at ELL students. And again, um, it's, it's not only the numbers, but it's also the needs of those students coming in and the amount of minutes that they need in order to meet those requirements. So next. When I report out, I can actually um, tell you and update you the number of students over the last few years, but I will also update you with the number of minutes that our incoming students are needing, um, which is why we need those extra periods of year long. Thank you. Yeah. So, Ruby, we have uh, several items here under operations. Painting and many things that we've shown the board in the past. Is there anything you want to share us about that? Um, so, if you go down a little bit, okay, so um, really the thing that you will see that's a little bit different is the areas that show either a five year plan or a multi year plan. Um, those are larger ticket items, um, and I actually have the detailed components of those plans. Um, so one of them is um, the tech department. There is a lot of equipment that was bought in our capital project that included the tech wing that has broken or is unrepairable, which really means that we are providing a class and something may not be working for the class we're providing. Um, those machines are very costly, so um, Hillary has worked with the, her tech department, or the district's tech department, um, and developed a multi-year plan of getting those items replaced. Um, I will just give you an example that one item, if we just said let's just do everything at one time, could cost seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. So um, I'm really appreciative for them taking the time to work that through so we can hopefully do this in pieces, um, get those things up and running, um, fix what we can with some things. They, they just don't carry that um, uh, hardware, the software, a lot of technology changes all the time. So just keeping up with that. Another item that is new here um, that has not been seen before is the PE Fitness Center. Um, they too came with a, a request last year, um, and I think it was just listed under, this is the cost for this in totality. And uh, Dr. Graham and myself, we met with quite a few people to sit down and make this more manageable um, to present this to the Board of Education. So they also not only just put together a five year plan, they've identified what equipment would be replaced in each phase as well as what equipment would be obsolete. Um, and then you'll see future requests for more space in capital world. Um, but we really just thought that this needed more available and uh, hopefully we can continue to, <laughs> to include these things in the budget uh, moving forward. Those were the only um, big items that stick out. There are a lot of items here. Some of them are new. Um, some of them you've seen before. There is a new request in reference to the high school elevator and that is, I think it is, and I can pull it, um, the actual software component for the elevator is outdated. Um, I'm going to review that a bit more so you may see that in a bit more detail uh, at the next meeting to figure out what needs to occur or does not need to occur because it's such a, a costly item. But we all donate our TIAS people elevators to school. Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> 
because I think I have two or three or two. <laughs> what was it? They're slightly different. Um, they actually have a color contrast, which is extremely helpful I'm just teasing. We all spent $100. Yeah. <laughs> but these are fancier. Yeah, well, I didn't realize my son had to plug his into charge it, so he must have a good one. Oh, it's his third one. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's what I said. <laughs> Do you want, you're asking for a breakdown? I can provide you. Oh, yeah, sure. Yes. Um, what I can do, um, if we want it to be at the next, okay, at the next meeting, I will uh, make sure copies are printed and you'll see the five-year plans um, laid out. Any other questions in this? Well, there is an item here for youth mental health first aid to be included in the budget for next year. Yes. Um, this is a big push across Western New York. Um, Jessica Hutchings has been participating in a uh, regional uh, series of meetings that include uh, all districts and all Erie County uh, support services for mental health. Uh, Cheryl is also going to be attending those meetings. We also bring up uh, Alyssa Brown as well, which is an elementary counselor, so we can um, scope out elementary and secondary as well. Yeah. And uh, if this is approved right away in July, all of our administrators would be trained uh, in youth mental health first aid to get us started. Uh, additionally, I see that uh, Mrs. Lise has requested health insurance for all drivers, and the cost is shown here. And then, uh, Ruby, I see you're recommending a transfer to food service. That's $8,000 the best year. I had to cut it. I had to cut it last year. And then we Yes, it was 15. So at 1,000 last year, what was our total? And with this 22, it how? It was 78,000. So this 22 is the last one, right? That would bring us to a, a $100,000. Yes, which was our end goal. And I have been looking for our fund availments sheet that I don't see. And, and that market. is in the next presentation. That's when I put in the. Well, I would like to know what the food supposed to be. Okay. Because I thought during um, COVID, our gap was moved quite a bit. Yes, and it, I think it was around 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. Yeah, I want to say that as a, a negative. From 700, 800,000. Yes, yeah. yeah, so there was a lot. Is that necessary to ask for 22,000 this year? So we closed our gap closer? Here are two things that um, are my thoughts. My first thought is we are back to full pay, right? Okay. Um, so that is in the back of my mind. So this will at least cover the balance. The other part of this is if the funds are not necessary, they do not go to food service. They stay within the general fund budget. So it could be something that is utilized in a different area if necessary, or it funnels down the fund balance. Or we could just budget it to somewhere else. To begin with, it's different. That's an option. It's my bone of contention. You know it. I know. That's why it's the very last thing. <laughs> and I wouldn't do it. It's only important. Right. <laughs> it's very. We do have a committee meeting on Thursday. Wednesday. And um, so some of that will be updated for you at the committee meeting. And then I'll also make sure that we do an update for the board. Thank you. Thank you. And this aligns well with what Ruby uh, as both superintendents have been advocating for, which is full funding of uh, food nutrition for all students across the state that it has made it to the finish line. Yes, and if that occurred, then I would just be like, zero it out. <laughs> so <laughs> push for that as well. That's right. You're welcome. <laughs> um, the next area is uh, the what is considered Proposition 2, which is our um, vehicle purchase prop. Um, this includes all the requests in this area. I, you will see here the number of buses um, and vehicles being requested as well as the cost of those. So that just helps you understand where the $917,000 is coming from. That is a substantial increase. Um, the cost of the buses has increased as well as vehicles. Vehicles in the past were roughly around $35,000 um, and then now roughly around $52,000 the trucks that we purchased. Um, I did mention before that uh, in the 
outside of the budget presentation, um, how we are receiving more when those are going to auction, which are also receiving more because the cost of them are going up on the other. Um, and I will continue to work with uh, transportation and buildings and grounds to kind of shake this out as we do with any other parts of the budget. Um, and so this will change. Sure, sure, change. Sure, we'll change. Yeah. Uh, as we move forward uh, with that information. And then the bottom part just reminds um, the board that we borrow, um, the, how long it's been occurring, and um, some of the estimates and fees. In the past, so I just kept it there. Any questions? So we're just looking at the vehicle um, mm -hmm. you know, purchases that were comparison. Oh, okay, from last year. Yep. I don't like how you're having the one. The one Dr. Graham started asking these questions. So Especially because an electric vehicle bus is for yes. yes. So we had two Ford F-350s last year and we have two more than this. We usually do them in pairs of two unless there is, um, I think the one year we were trying to get a van um, that had been. Most is the district. I was just the I will get an exact number for you. Just curious. Another question. Okay. So this is an important uh, request for the board to consider as our committee has been working on looking at uh, maybe a future capital project. Uh, and we're far away from that, but it would be helpful if a capital reserve fund was established again. Rudy, if you could just give a little history to this, that would be great. Sure. So um, this outlines uh, pretty nicely um, the amount that the voters approved it was approved in 2008 it had a the terms of the reserve um, was 15 years which is nice because sometimes you just see 10 years so um, it was 15 years and funded amount means that was how much funds at some point in time um, was placed in the reserve and spent out of the reserve for past capital projects so as we talk about um, with our facility planning committee and we talk to the board about any future capital projects um, one of the things that helps with the I guess I would say taxpayer burden of doing capital work is having funds placed in a reserve you cannot place funds into a capital reserve that is expired and you cannot place funds into one that doesn't exist so um, this reserve is a bit different. Usually I could come to the board and say, hey, I think we should establish a new reserve. Most of them just need board approval, um, and you would help me um, establish an amount. Capital reserves do require the community to vote on the allowable limit, and they also require the community to vote to take those funds out of the reserve and use it for a capital project. Um, I, we don't have $10 million shuffled off to the side. I think it's always important to point that out. Um, but this would allow us to put it out for vote to the taxpayers. And as the funds become available, as we review each year with our auditors, uh, of, um, anything in excess when it comes to fund balance, um, what are reserve amounts we currently have that may be too high, um, and they may tell you to, you can put them in your capital reserve, those funds would be there for a project. The other part that I think is important to mention, I know um, the planning committee has heard me say this multiple times, but as a board, is when you vote on the actual capital project, the reserves have to already be there. It can't be a thought like, hey, I'm gonna have $5 million in reserves two years from now when I go to actually pay for the project. When the community votes on it, they need to know all financials being obligated to that. So having this in advance and being able to fund it um, with whenever that future project comes is very helpful. And then these just are... But these are not all encompassing. No, I was no. going to say because the middle school locker rooms is not on. <laughs> these were items that were briefly mentioned during a okay. budget discussion. 
So um, people have different categories on their sheet that they submit and work with me. And there were components that people were like, I know that's capital. I know it's capital, but I want it to be mentioned. So this just shows you some of those components. This has nothing to do with our air planning committee. Air air like you that. just had to say air <laughs> It has nothing to do with um, any of those. This were, these were just budget items. You usually see some of these things throughout the request, but we always just say, hey, it's going to be capital, or I'll say capital on the side. So I just put it here as a, a thought process of, hey, these are some things, as well as whatever the um, actual planning committee comes up with and presents to the board. Does that make sense? Any questions here? I have a question on the proposition number two for the buses. Do we, is it the 465 passenger buses are we replacing, is it, is it apples to apples, are we replacing four 65 passenger buses? So then the two 29 passenger buses that we would acquire, is that replacing two that we already have? Can we see a list of what the year mm -hmm. is and what the mileage for those? And then I'm wondering, in, in other districts, do they, are they on, I don't know what our replacement schedule is, but are we on a similar replacement or comparable? I mean, we were talking about data for a $400,000 purchase of a bus, which is a huge investment. This is also a huge investment. So data-wise, I'm just curious, are we on a similar schedule to other districts that do not contract out for busing? So like in, in Newport, we do not have our own buses, but for districts that do have their own fleet of buses, are we comparable in terms of how often they're being replaced? Are we more aggressively replacing our, our buses because we're afraid to, or not afraid, but we um, don't want to incur the maintenance costs and we understand why we need to replace them and all of that. I just want to know, are we, based on data, comparable, comparable to other districts with a replacement schedule? And um, you already answered my question that we are, would be replacing uh, two, four, three, a 350s, two 29 passenger buses, and four 65 I guess the important thing to mention with this relationship to the question is um, the cost to maintain the buses and also resale value. I know this comes up every couple of years, maybe every year. I think it's important to know um, in the years that if we're replacing every five years, I can't remember, I don't know the number, what the decrease in our resale value is because I know that is a factor in why we came up with the, um, the schedule we have. Just so we all have a complete picture is awesome. Thing. What I'd like to know, though, is actual numbers. Like, when we put them on auctions international, what did we get for those vehicles that we put on auction international? Yeah, it's great to know they're worth X, well, but what did we actually get? Oh, you're actually... Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes not the projected amount. Correct. Okay, yes. yes. I'm sorry, I misunderstood oh, that. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I would like to know what we actually got on Auctions International when we sold when we sold the last bit of replacement versus what we could get or what they're worth because sometimes things are worth, but what you get is something totally different. So um, I'm just making sure I gather this. I don't have the answers for everything, but I just want to make sure I've gotten everything there is a request about. So there's um, the number of vehicles. That was one, that was what you approved um, for this meeting. I'm going to compile it for that. But, but it can change, right? So when it goes up to off, it, yes. So each year, those um, the amounts you get for the vehicle can be different. Um, there are a lot of things to take into consideration, which could be um, the actual look of the vehicle, the mileage on the vehicle, if there are any issues, all those things. So um, what we'll do is we will compile that. Um, that's not hard to do. Another um, component is the replacement plans physically with the vehicles shown for both buses and trucks. Um, that's not an issue either. And then I will also send out a lister to um, my business official group and ask them how many of you purchase your own vehicles how many, how large is your fleet, and uh, what is your replacement plan? Are you replacing three a year, five a year? 
Um, and is it just based on that's the flow of the plan? Um, is it beyond useful life? I do believe, Teresa's is here, I do believe um, many years ago we bought a rather large group of buses, a rather large number of buses. So some of that is you can't, I couldn't come back to you and say, hey, in one year, if you bought 10 buses, I need to replace these 10 buses that are beyond useful life. So some of that is being captured, but you'll see that when um, I bring forward the information. Um, I may send it to you early because it's just a lot of different information things that you guys want for next meeting, as well as there will be a lot of presentations just so you have it, um, and then you can highlight any questions you may have for the meetings. And I'm saying for like warranties, I'm assuming. You I think in 10-year. And is it, and I, I, forgive me, I'm not sure how what buses work in relation to, you know, your car, but is it certain items are covered under warranty um, versus others, you know, like, I don't know, like your engine is so many years on your car versus your, you know. Yeah, it, a 10 year warranty is, is divided, it, it's usually bumper to bumper, we, we purchase a little extra for the 10 year warranty. Cummins engines have the warranties, things like that are very applicable and very important to when how long we, um, but our bus replacement plan basically takes our buses at a 10 year old, 100,000 miles, and we, if you will see, and you'll probably know, uh, the districts will replace 10% of their buses per year. So we're right there, a little bit below uh, a 10% change uh, year to year. So, and if you look at, and Ruby did reflect upon the year that we did have a lot of purchase, that was an emissions situation from 2009-2010, so we're at 22, 23, and we're just playing, playing catch up to, we still have 10s and 11s and 12s in our fleet, and so we have to take into consideration, um, some, are, some are really worth it, some are great in the Auctions International uh, sale, and then some are you know, they, they they don't do as great. You just never know what, what people are looking for. But um, so yeah, I we can provide all that information for you. And then the the one hundred and sixty thousand dollar estimate for the health insurance for the drivers for twenty drivers, is that is that number do you think that's what it would cost for a single I mean is that it seems like it's such a it just seems like a, a low number to me based on, how, I, it seems like it's, I don't want to say not, is it is it a, an underestimate or would you say that's like a pretty good estimate of what that would be for 20 people? Um, because it just seems like it's, it's not single. It's, it's, it's single. not taking into consideration coverage outside of that. And the thought process, and, and Teresa and I have talked about this before, um, the state will aid you on single health insurance, they will aid you transportation aid on a single health insurance plan for transportation drivers. So that's what this request encompasses. The reality is, um, and I, I've done listservs about this multiple times, um, trying to get engaged from other districts, do you just offer single health insurance plans? A lot of districts will tell you they offer health insurance and people opt into that. So someone could be family, someone could be single, somebody could be employee spouse, and then they get um, their different ways based on their collective bargaining agreements that those people contribute towards the plan. So this is just if people were offered a single health insurance plan, that would, this is what the cost would That's be. That's what it would be. But, then you have to take into the fact that that would also require negotiating with the union because we don't say to anyone else and to say you can only have single. Mm -hmm. So I just show the request, um, but we do have a lot of that discussion in the background of this is the request, but there are a lot of loopholes um, to get over. It seemed like a low number to me. That's why I wanted to share it was more it's about what it would actually right? be. And, it just seems like with the trouble we have with drivers, I don't know. But anyway, I'm just, I'm just wondering how it compares to replacing vehicles, you know, providing, providing that. And in my head, I'm 
I'm just thinking is that is that number where it would be for the same plan? I say this respectfully across all bargaining units, across all individuals. We are self funded, right? So that number has no limit. And and it could be an eight thousand dollar cost, it could be an eight hundred thousand dollar cost. It has no limit in a self funded world. So there are a lot of things that are taken into consideration. Um, this is just a, a dollar amount of, hey, if we're able to say we're offering a single plan, this is what it would cost. Thank you. Okay. So you'll see this slide a lot over the next <laughs> few uh, budget presentations because it is important. We really, if we don't do this, then we still do a capital project. Um, it'll be fully on um, the backs of the taxpayers. This just takes everything you've heard and seen today and summarize it nicely into uh, revenue areas and expense areas. Scroll a little bit more. You will see that the request total without and the request total with. Um, so without was the original number you saw um, when we were going piece by piece as we were rolling the budget budget over. With request is everything that we just discussed um, that happened per our meetings with different staff, administrative teams, and groups. Um, clearly, uh, the end goal is the balance budget. So lots of work ahead uh, and lots of work for the board in future discussions. Um, these are the upcoming dates. Dr. Graham did go over this. You do have one additional um, sheet for me that is from State Aid and Financial Planning Services. Um, I know sometimes there are questions on why we do things when we do them um, based on calendars. And um, I wanted to provide this just so the board had a, a better understanding and so the community could hear um, during this presentation that there are specific state aid deadlines that are put in place. Um, I did highlight some things out for you, but I think the, the biggest thing is in reference to um, once the April 21st date hits and beyond. And those are um, things for the district clerk to make sure hits the papers four times before the budget vote, um, as well as the requirement for a budget statement to go out, which we have changed a bit this, uh, this last year to make it far more um, easy to read, more graphs, uh, really comparing year over year data, as well as lastly, the um, budget hearing requirement. So um, I know May 8th always sounds like a late date when the vote is the week after, but that is the requirement is between seven and 14 days. Um, we fall right within that, so and we have to follow that. Um, if the board has questions about anything in the presentation, if the community has questions about anything in the presentation, um, feel free to reach out. This information will go up on the website hopefully tomorrow, so it'll be accessible. I know Alice has scheduled meetings, and we usually try to put something in the paper. So that hopefully is helping people as well, but definitely reach out um, and ask your questions and, and voice any concerns. Um, you don't have to wait to the budget hearing to do that. Actually, waiting to the budget hearing is probably not the best time because um, it gets voted the next day. And that is it. Our next meeting is March 18th. 13th. I'm done. So it will be there only 40 more slides. No? No. no. All right, perfect. Thank you. We will move on to special education. Where should we them? If I could have action on CPSC and CSC program recommendations, please. I'll vote. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 7 0. Thank you. And that brings us to the superintendent's report. And speaking of 40 slides, I will not show you 40 <laughs> slides. But I know that a board member had asked about uh, vaping in our high school. So the first slide is a uh, breakdown of the number of offenses that have occurred over time. So you'll see a historical look at vaping from 2011-2012. 
2010 to 2011 here, all the way to 22 and 23. So at this time, uh, I believe, I'll uh, just look at this summary here, that we have 17 students who have uh, received consequences based on the code of conduct violations related to vaping, and two of those students are repeat offenders, which brings up to 19. Do we have any questions about those, that little bit of information so far? Sure, so the question is about the code of conduct and what are the consequences when students have either paraphernalia or have been caught smoking or using vape. That's your question. Uh, it's always progressive discipline, but this will give you an example uh, on this slide of some of that progressive discipline numbers. So you'll see that during the suspension, students uh, receive uh, discipline for vaping. They watch a, a video on the dangers of vaping. They complete a quiz based on what they've learned, and they write a one-page persuasive essay convincing, convincing someone to quit vaping uh, or not to vape. So it's in school suspension? That it could be in school or out of school, but it's progressive, depending on how many times a person's been caught. But this would be an entry, I would think, an entry level uh, in school suspension with these um, resources provided to students as a learning opportunity. Uh, additionally, um, there are meetings with the school social workers, one at the start of the suspension and one at the end of the suspension for additional education and referrals uh, and to further discuss uh, the results of the essay. Uh, additionally, you'll see that parents and students are given referrals to uh, kids escaping drugs for their vaping education program and other resources to quit vaping. There's info below that was an email to me, so it's, it's not in the slide. Uh, additionally, you'll see there was uh, one report regarding the perception of student vaping in a classroom, and that was this year, and that was thoroughly investigated. So right now, we do not have any evidence of vaping occurring in classrooms. To that end, if a student uh, believes that another student is vaping or a parent Here's a report that students are vaping in the classroom. Our high school administration is always available to receive that information. School social workers, counselors, and teachers and trusted adults can be uh, given that information by students or parents, and that will then flow to our high school administration. Any questions about that? And you know the the rest uh, the newest information that I want to share is that the district started a podcast. So I will show you what that looks like. So um, the district has created uh, three different podcasts, uh, and we will be recording. Um, actually, Kent Devines will be published Friday. Thank you, Dr. Plotty. And then I will be recording a podcast with our high school on Friday, and that will be published the following Friday. So uh, our goal is to have five different podcasts published each month uh, for the rest of the year and going into next year, highlighting the wonderful work of our teachers and administrators, staff, and shining spotlight on the students. So if you're interested, you can also visit our website. And I believe if you go under Community and choose Inspiring Viking Values, you'll see those podcasts are published here. Uh, and when I send the link out to families, it takes them to this page. So it's kind of fun, and you can you know, click a podcast and begin to listen. Uh, and uh, Mark could have just about it, but we really don't need to listen to the page. But it's all here for everybody to listen, and I can tell you it's pretty popular. Um, over 200 people listen to Sidway and um, other, others. Uh, I think uh, the Youth Road one was very popular too in a short period of time, uh, approaching 150 listeners. So it seems to be resonating with our community. Any questions about the podcast? Very unique. And uh, the rest of these slides are, are here. This is actually the first episode of the podcast. And we have a lovely student uh, join us. And she was pretty excited to learn 
what podcasting was all about. I did have to ask her if she knew what the radio was. And we had a, a very a wonderful conversation about that media. Uh, but really wonderful opportunities. Um, this is uh, Claire, and she was on her middle school podcast talking about the web program and two of our stars at Heath Road uh, in their most recent musical joined us last week. So it's been a lot of fun, and it's been really great to feature kids and all of the work that they're doing in our schools. Any questions about that? And so you'll just see some, some and this is uh, this Friday. So Kegabine's podcast will be uh, published, and I think this one focuses on the PTA and all the good work that they're doing at Kegabine. So these are just lovely photos. I usually talk a lot about all these things, but these are just some of the wonderful things that have occurred since the last time we were together. And Melissa Holmes came to Sidway to read, uh, and it was a real big hit. So thank you, Mr. Antonio, for showing that photo. Amelia Earhart the other night was outstanding. I'd say there were about 150-ish uh, participants, parents and kids, uh, in the auditorium, uh, sponsored by the Grand Island Santa. And uh, this is really uh, an incredible passion of, um, of Dr. Stacy Schroeder Watts. And these are all PhDs or MDs uh, associated with her work or her connections with the University at Buffalo. And they uh, you know, provided tremendous information on up and coming careers in STEM. And Ruby got a chance to read I and take a picture with you and Eric. I saw the other picture. Thank you for doing that. And this is our modified basketball team. And I know I've shared this with the board before, but we're really excited during February break. This wall will be transformed into a really exciting um, new uh, place where our kids and families can take beautiful uh, selfies and family pictures uh, to celebrate all the good things that they're doing in our high school. So that's all that I have for you today. Okay. Moving on to the Board of Education report. Um, so you have some reports and you want to highlight things on this report. So as well, we all know, July 17th is our golf tournament. Um, I attended the PTA Council meeting. A um, couple of dates. Uh, April 25th is the um, IOI PTA meeting where there will be the budget, budget presentation, correct? And so that's April 25th. April 27th is the celebration of inspiration for those that want to attend that awesome event. Um, community relations, we are working on the um, survey that we do every year for communication, how they want to receive it, um, how often they want to receive it, and um, questions like that. I also attended the uh, DEI committee. Um, that I just wanted to mention briefly, it is not a um, one of our set board um, committees, but I, I did attend, and I just want to say that Mike, Gloria, and Amy Mann do a phenomenal job facilitating um, the meetings. They're doing excellent work. I'm excited to see. It's just at the ground level. They break into groups. They do um, a lot of brainstorming. We talk about you know, issues and concerns, and they're really doing a lot of great work on the ground floor. I attended as a board member, and I just really wanted them to know that they had our support, um, and if they had any questions, any concerns, or if there was anything they needed to bring to the board um, for support, that we are here. Um, we always encourage great work. It was fun to see a committee in action, because we typically don't see that. Um, Sherry sits on it as a parent, which is phenomenal. I wish we had more parents. I think we just had two. Um, um, Jen Wallowitz and Sherry, which is fantastic. Um, so I probably will stop by. I don't really feel there's you know, a place for a board member, seeing it's, um, I'm, it's just not one of our committees. I think it's excellent work, but I, you know, it definitely was great to see an admin, teachers, students were there. They did a phenomenal job. It was actually great to see a committee because we don't often get to see that. So um, I just wanted to mention that. I don't know if Sherry wants to mention any of that. She actually sat in the breakout groups as a parent. Yeah. 
Um, oh, Alice was there too, sorry. Wow, well, there was a lot of people here that were there. But I really commend the work that you're doing, Mike, and I really am anxious to see um, how it all evolves, and I'm really interested in what, how the kids will do at the next um, professional level, and I'm sure you will report out, um, and obviously if it relates to any policy changes or anything that is when you as a board will take a look at it and do what you need to do. Um, that's it. I just mentioned that if you do have a student in the high school, if you could please consider joining the PTA, our numbers are down. Uh, there's a link on the website that's real easy and it's $10 and we appreciate it. Thank you. Danielle, did you have anything to highlight on your agenda? Yeah, I'll see the Okay. So the next item is social media accounts. Sure. I the last time, the first uh, community relations maybe we talked a lot about uh, trying to reach more people where they are. Uh, so we did start an Instagram and ran out of a Facebook account. I actually uh, went and was taught how to use Instagram by Mike Antonelli. Uh, so I thank, I thank him for that. Um, and our principals are actually uh, posting on Instagram as well. And we've seen an increase in viewership and participation of about 240-ish, two, maybe 250, um, which was from 13, so that was really good. <laughs> and uh, Joy, I know this is a question that you have, so. So, just a couple questions. Um, I know with um, Instagram, again, as well as with Facebook, you can have multiple admins and multiple people can post on one account we do that now. So how is that, at Instagram is the principals are posting and, and Facebook? Myself and the principals. Is it the same for Facebook? Yes, because uh, the way we set it up is that our account will automatically post to Instagram and then Facebook. Yeah, it'll, yeah. yeah, you can click a little thing yeah. over. Yeah, I learned that from my kids. <laughs> <laughs> we do it because we have offices across the state, so each partner in our office each has the same admin access right. to post. So, the question I had, first of all, was who was posting and monitoring it just to make sure. Um, like, I'm thinking ch comments, um, children who, parents who may not want their children on social media, pictures of children. Um, you know, the school district you know, website is one thing, but when you, if a parent is scrolling through <coughs> Instagram or Facebook and they see their child on there and they didn't consent, how is that being regulated? Parents can, as you know, parents can opt out of that type of photo. But is there sure. a running list? There I mean, is, yeah. Do you guys on, know which yeah, children in your schools? It's all on our student database. Yeah. Okay. Part of our registration. Okay, perfect. And then when there's a comment on there mm -hmm. that may not be suitable mm -hmm. for our district page, is it because I know from being an admin on these social media, you guys are all getting hit at the same time with the notification. So is somebody then removing this comment or are there procedures in place to regulate it, remove it? So I have post-traumatic stress syndrome related to Facebook during COVID. And I had to be talked into this at the Community Relations Committee. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, we're dipping our toes in the water to see if it's going to be a helpful tool to communicate. If we see that it is a mashing, you know, yeah. negative place, then we will easily shut it down. Uh, honestly, I, I joke a little bit, but I'm, I spend a lot of time, I used to spend a lot of time posting on my own personal yeah. Facebook page, yeah. stuff that's related to the school, and I almost stopped doing that during COVID. Sure. So, uh, so we'll monitor it, we are monitoring it. We haven't, I haven't seen anything negative, and honestly our Facebook, the new Facebook page, to be honest with you, it has less participation than the Instagram account. Yeah, most people have on Instagram. And there's also ways you can turn off comments as well. So sure. if you want to post pictures of, you know, whatever's going on in, with the district or the school, you can yeah. easily turn them off so we don't have to exactly. actually filter through that. Yeah. And it would be just something like for conversation, do we want to across the board not allow comments or do
do allow comments, but then you have to yeah. go through each comment sure. to figure out if something is not appropriate to be posted, you know, on social media because it's going to fuel. I do. I think of COVID and the parent groups and these Facebook pages that, yes. you know, everything that was sent or when you run a, your campaign and the stuff that goes all over, yeah. you know, social media with that, and people believe it yes. because it's posted, and now it's posted on the district site. Yeah. And someone may post something that may not be accurate, and then it's going to filter through the community as sure. something that may be true when it's not. Yeah. Well, and it's so, so they, they copy it so fast and they, yeah. they, they repost spread it. it so fast. We had a board of education page that we took out, yeah. yeah. And it was supposed to be for school closings and different things, and it just turned into, you know, and, and, it, and it's not just COVID. I mean, it, it's everything. I mean, everything is discussed, analyzed. And unfortunately, if you have an opinion on Facebook, you're going to get torn apart for it, right? So the concern is, is that it's going to happen on a Facebook page that we really want to put out great news. And um, right. I mean, it's a you see it happen. Yeah. Hey, look at this great thing. Nice thought. So fast. <laughs> oh. They copy Look at this wonderful <laughs> thing. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. We don't like yeah. wonderful things. Yeah. 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 So it's we'll, we'll like definitely five, watch right? it. I, I, yeah. I don't yeah. joke. I mean, I very cautious, yeah. really moving uh, based on the Community Relations Committee input, and we'll continue to monitor it. And please, if you see anything, let me know. I haven't. I haven't I seen anything. I do look. Yeah. Thank you. Thank anything you. else, Jen? No, those are just okay. questions, and, you know, I just, if we see something, then I think we just have to have a conversation with these social media pages and comments, and if the decision's going to be made to permanently turn off comments or allow comments. The sharing, can, you know, because you can restrict, you can restrict a lot through Facebook when it's, because Instagram is owned through Meta, which is also owned through Facebook. It's all the same company, so you can restrict off of both sites. I had to learn all this because I'm one of the posters for my company. It's so amazing. I didn't, I, honestly, I didn't know that you could put something on Instagram and it would share it with Twitter and two different companies. Yeah. It was surprising. Yeah, and it shares with a couple of other social media sites too. Yeah. So we, as long as I know that we're going to continuously... And the committee's really helping guide it. They really are talking into it, absolutely. Yeah, because so. I, I have to tell you, I, I was in the airport, and I was scrolling through Facebook, and it popped up, and yeah. I called Sue, I'm like, we have a Facebook page. I'm like, what's going on? Yeah. You know, because I think of, you know, I, as a lawyer, I just think yeah. of my ability, and I think of the district, and I think of the kids, and I think of, you know, what kids are, if they're accidentally being posted on there, and my ability to the district if right. the parents didn't want to show of course. Yeah. So it's nice that we already have procedures in place. Yeah. And it's, a, it's um, our infinite campus database, so it's available for everybody. You know, everybody yeah. internally is it. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, moving on. I actually requested beeping. I wonder if we can move it to the next. Well, I just actually did a couple slides related to that. Yeah. So if there's missing, if there's information that's missing that you need, no, I I have uh, questions and things that I want to comment on, but I don't want to hold the group. Well, why don't you give some ideas so, so that we can have? Yeah, we um, if there's information to look for for that. So I'm just I was wondering. So 17. And you did show in years past how many other students were identified, you know, based on the year and that kind of thing. How are students being identified with their vaping? And do you feel it's reflective of the number of students in, say, middle school or the high school that are actually vaping? Because I feel as though the problem is a lot greater. It's a lot more widespread than maybe what is being identified, um, I think a lot more than 17 students, you know, are vaping, and is it in, in during school, during when they're changing in the locker rooms, when they're in the bathrooms, and like I said, I don't want to take up a ton of time with, with other things right now, but it's, is, are there other ways we could identify and get kids, you know, help in terms of, you know, issues with vaping, because it feels though it's becoming, more of a problem than it was in the past. As time goes on, yet we have the same number of students being identified, or even um, in this year, fewer students that were that are being identified than the years past. And, and it's mid-year, right? So there's 17 mid-year, 19 total. Uh, last year was 30. A few years ago, 2017, 18 was 42. 
So these are kids being taught, they're being taught by teachers, they're being taught by SROs, they're being taught by administrators, typically in bathrooms, right? And congregating in those areas. Um, and, and to your point, sure, there's, there's probably students that aren't being taught, right? But um, clearly there, there is uh, a lot of work being done to identify the kids and the proactive approach when they are caught uh, is a little bit different than just the shame of pressure. So, uh, so sure, if you want to email myself on the board with additional questions you'd like to see in the future board meeting. Yeah. I mean, I really, obviously, I'm in favor of fake detectors and, and having, you know, detectors in where students change for locker rooms and bathrooms because I feel as though, you know, it's very easy, even when you have a vape detector for a student to hide a vape, but you have the data, and you, you know, we talked a lot about data in this meeting, you have the data and you know where the hot spots are and you know at what times of the day you typically see students. We have all these cameras we could utilize to help us figure out which students are in the bathrooms at those times to really uh, know who to keep an eye on. And I feel as though we have this technology with cameras Yet, if it was paired with vape detectors, we'd be able to get students the help they need. Because I feel as though what you were presenting in terms of how we help students after they're identified is great. I think it's wonderful that students are watching videos and completing paragraphs on why they shouldn't vape and things of that nature. But it would be, I know personally for me, very difficult to identify a student because immediately when they see an adult coming or hear an adult coming, they hide the vape. Whether or not they hide the vape when the vape detector goes off, the data is still compiled by the technology to be able to tell you which bathrooms, which changing areas students are vaping in, and then you can go to the cameras and compile you know, information on when it's happening, what students are vaping, and I feel as though those numbers would shoot from 17 or 30 to 100, 200. I mean, I feel as though it's a huge epidemic in our schools, every school, everywhere. Not just Grand Island, but it's an epidemic. And 17 students, 30 students, 50 students, that doesn't, that's not reflective of the epidemic that it is. I, I appreciate that. I, I know we've talked about this in the past. I know that there are <coughs> false positives. So what ends up happening is when an alert is sent to the administrator, it requires the administrator to go home and check it out, and oftentimes there are false positives. So you have administrators running around addressing false positives with the technology. So that is definitely a concern of ours, and that's why we haven't moved in the direction of adding those detectors to our schools. Uh, and, and I haven't seen, and Mr. Lurie, I know you've done a lot of background research on this, I just haven't seen whether or not this technology is producing the results that we want it to produce. I don't know if you have an opinion on it. I don't even think administrators need to follow when you get an alert. I just think you need to analyze the data after the fact. I think people need to sit around the table and look at the data. So I don't think administrators should be getting a ping on their phone and running to the bathroom or running to the changing area or running around the school. I think what administrators need to do is, you know, they'll look at, they'll see the pings and they'll look at the report, and what happens is vape detectors will give you a detailed report of when the pings are occurring, when people are vaping where, and if it's a false positive, you'll know that you'll be able to use all these tens of thousands of dollars that are in our budget for these cameras. You'll be able to look at the ping happened at 10.21 a.m. You'll be able to go to the cameras, 200, and how many cameras do we have? Hundreds around these buildings, You'll be able to go to those cameras and see exactly which students at 1021 went in that bathroom, and you'll know that that student is someone you need to, you know, not run and chase after when you get a ping, but keep an eye on. You know, I would say to that, actually, just from a parent's perspective, if he goes off at 1020 and your daughter, or I don't know, we all have daughters, they're all in the bathroom. We sit down four hours later and I get a telephone call after. You don't call a parent until you actually see it and know it identifies. I'm, I'm just saying, after the fact, if you're not in there catching them with it, they can still dispose of it. And if there's no proof, right, that your daughter, my daughter, her daughter, 
we can't find proof hours later after we sit at the table, then how do we identify if it was your daughter, my daughter, or her daughter? Yeah. You never want to call a parent unless you absolutely see it. I totally so, agree with you on that one. the parent, but how do we go? Because if they're flushing down the toilets or throwing them out, how do we, how do we determine which one of our children yeah. did it if we're not running? This is Right. Like I'm not well, they used, it, they used it at North Carolina, and they were able to be pretty accurate. And but even when somebody would hide it, the bath. I, I'm just saying. Well, they would, but the, the child wouldn't always know that it goes off. They don't. They have no idea. So they would but show up. I'm just saying. And they caught a it, lot of kids, especially regulars that were doing to it. The bathroom. It's hard to prove after the fact. I'm just saying. Right. Well, once you get the thing, you do want to go to the bathroom. Right. You do want to break have it up. And you can't wait and sit around and look at campus. It's and we caught a lot of kids that really needed help, like really needed help, because it was, they were continually doing it, continually. Um, and obviously, we don't just, they don't just have, um, you know, they, they have marijuana. You know, and, and we had kids that were, as a nurse, um, you know, I, that we had to call the ambulance on. You know, it's becoming worse and worse because of things that they're putting in it. And it's important that we are on top of it because you don't want to have to wait until a kid needs to be called for an ambulance, um, you know, because they're, they're doing it or they're sharing it or somebody brings something in that has something in it that shouldn't. You know, I had multiple kids go to the emergency room because they had a vape that they didn't know had drugs in it um, and it made them very disoriented. Um, so, I mean, I think Ashley has a really good point. And we should I, I find agree, ways to get better at identifying I, I it and agree, keeping kids safe in schools. Can't wait four hours to sit down and review a tape. No, you yeah. shouldn't wait four no. hours, but it will be a similar group of kids. You will become getting a, a pattern that will that you will be able to start identifying, and you will be able to kind of catch them and say, okay, this is becoming a major issue. It's and and you know and you, and a lot of time they did find the vapes um, on them or on the floor or whatnot, and then you can start to identify what they're bringing to school. You know, those really things are all important. Just, just for process, I found faulting. And to be honest, I, I mean, I know we talked about it. Um, the admin team has looked into it. I, I would like to see what's being done. I would like some more information on the cost and, and what we have to staff to be able to have these people going to these things to be here. I'm not saying that it's not, it's not an issue, I'm not saying it's not an act, you know, whatever, but we need to be responsible in how we do it. And if we're going to spend the money to put these detectors in, then we need to have the staff and the people available to go to the bathrooms. Yes, you know, you, you can ask your child which bathrooms that's being done in, right? You know, it's, and there are certain, do I think it's more than 17? Absolutely. But I think we need to be smart in the way we spend our money and the way we do our resources. I'm just saying, as a parent, and listening to the parents in our community, that if you were 99% sure it was my daughter, not yours, and then I come in and say, what do you have? Well, I have little Sue, Susie in the bathroom at 10 20, and well, did you find anything? No, well, no, we didn't, but you know, she was the choice. It, it, it's not, it's not going to work. Yeah, but it would be like a it would be a continual thing, right? So that's the point is well, that eventually point you too. will catch what well, because if it's a problem and they're addicted to it, which many kids are, I, I they're going to continually agree. hit those things and it's going to be the same child. Have resources, then they yeah. need to use properly. But I know we got a problem. Every other school district follows the things. That's what I'm saying. That's what we learn, mm -hmm. right? So we have to make sure that we have the money to put them in and the staff to be able to do it and to do it right. And I'm not saying you dismiss those. Dis I'm not saying dismiss the pings and don't ever follow a ping, but I'm really, really interested too in analyzing the data and looking for patterns and looking for students that are really addicted to vapes and, and vaping. And I agree. I mean, I know we spent a lot of money on those arms that go up and down for safety. I like to see them shut at the bus loop at the in the front. I don't want to spend money on bait detectors that aren't going to be used, that aren't going to be monitored, that the data is not going to be looked at, but I think it needs to be not just responding to all the pains, but also looking at the data that the bait detectors can provide to see which kids are 
really addicted to vaping. And I just, I think it's, it's a huge, it's a huge issue. And I feel as though we've had this conversation many years. I think in 2017, was it? You were principal. Was it 2017 when I first asked, you know, let's investigate this. Let's look at it. We had presentations on the cost, which school districts were doing it. Then again, maybe it was 2019. I brought it up again. So I bring it up every couple of years. And as I'm bringing it up, now there's marijuana in Bates. You know, in 2017, there was not. There was not students that were vaping with marijuana in it. It wasn't happening as frequently. It wasn't as big of an issue. It's the longer we wait, the larger an issue it is. I feel as though we are just ignoring a huge epidemic and just missing the boat on this. But I wanted to express my opinion again, as I did in 2017, that vape detectors, you know, are needed to establish patterns, see which students are addicted, and really make sure that we're getting help because I think the program that's in place for when you identify those 17 or 30 students is excellent. But we need to identify 100 students a year, 200 students a year. We, we have a huge problem. It's an epidemic. I just, I know, I know, oh, Ashley, thank you. I, I know this is a tough one. I, everyone's very passionate. I, Brian asked me to say a few comments. I just want everyone to know, I think that having talked to most of our administrators, I know that they're willing to go in whatever direction as a board. So I, you know, I think there's, it's, there's, there's value. Well, it's, it's yeah. the administration's decision, not ours. But I think there is anxiety over it, and there's also, like, the idea of it is a pandemic. Serious, serious pandemic, and I think if my children were in that situation, I would want to hope that the school did everything they could as well. But I also know, being an administrator, that when you're in an observation and you're in the that you're in your things that this comes out, you can't just leave that observation and right. just go address it. And that time, there's got to be a plan. Does the data give you valuable information? Absolutely. Have we had situations where we get that information for kids? I mean, no, we can't really you know, whittle it down to a certain time frame that data can help do that. That's more what I'm interested in. Is, I mean, both things are great, but I'm not saying every administrator has to respond to every single thing. It's good to respond as many as you can, but I'm more interested in like that long-term data. You know, I just think we are missing the boat, and it's going to be sinking more and more. I mean, it's, it's an epidemic now here. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. It's not just a Grand Island problem. I do want to highlight that. And, and I'm not bringing this up. This isn't a new thing I brought up just now. It's from 2017, and it's it's a problem. It's, it's what's up. Thank you, and we'll review it again. Okay. And no one signed up for the public comment session, so we're to any of the whole items information for them. It's not really going. Dr. Flachi did a wonderful job with the Healthy Heart Night. Um, so many amazing ideas and so many fun activities for the kids. Um, I don't know if I know it before, but this year was fantastic. So thank you. And um, I love that the kids, my son was able to go see the play, even parts of it. He loved it. So that was a really great field trip to let them see the arts and, and in the arts, their own district. I, thought that was, I didn't even know they were going to I just want to say I did see the high school musical. It was excellent. Congratulations to all the students and staff involved. What a phenomenal production. I'm all set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All set. All set. Thank you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Brian. Happy Valentine's Day to us. Actually, a couple of hours. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we will adjourn at 10.38. Oh. 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 Motion. We need a motion. And a second. All in favor. Aye. Seven. Motion carries. Seven. To adjourn at 10.38. Warm up back.